Good morning. My name is Marina Castellan. I work as a neuro-oncology nurse practitioner at the Brain Cancer Group. I would like to begin by acknowledging all traditional custodians and pay respects to elders past and present as we endeavour to serve the health needs within the community. We recognise the importance of the land and the waterways as an integral part of people's health and wellbeing. The Brain Cancer Group is proud to sponsor today's education forum and we hope you all enjoy the day and are able to learn something new or just know that you are being supported through these groups such as the Brain Cancer Group and Brain Tumor Alliance Australia. At the Brain Cancer Group, we are focused on improving patient outcomes across the spectrum. We do this by taking a multidisciplinary and collaborative approach aimed at improving the lives of those impacted by brain cancer. We achieve this by fulfilling three tiers, research, education and support. We welcome you to the Brain Tumor Alliance Australia Patient Education and Information Session. Today's uh, meeting will begin shortly. Um, it will, we have three presentations, great presentations by three doctors. Uh, we will then go into an, a Q&A session around 11.40 this morning um, and the morning session will conclude around 12.15 um, lunchtime. We now have two videos uh, from our support. The first from Associate Professor Eng Su Ko, Chair of the Cooperative Trials Group for Neuro-Oncology Cognome, and the second from Mr Billy Williams from Brain Tumor Alliance Australia. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the 2021 Brain Tumor Alliance Australia Patient Education and Information Forum. My name is Associate Professor Eng Su Ko. I work as a radiation oncologist at Liverpool Hospital in Sydney and it is indeed my privilege as Chair of COGNO, the National Cooperative Trials Group for Neuro-Oncology, to say a few words of welcome and introduce this forum. I must say the forum program looks absolutely fantastic, spanning current and horizon clinical trials, as well as the role of genomics and the immune system in developing personalised treatments for people affected by brain tumours. Supportive care for both patients and their carers is an absolute cornerstone, and it is gratifying to note that optimal, integrative and novel approaches will all be covered. I'm especially excited to hear pearls of wisdom from my dear colleague and international expert Maureen Daniels, whom I had the honour of working with during my fellowship period in Toronto, Canada. From my own personal involvement in such patient forums, I've found these to be wonderful opportunities to connect in a very honest way with patients, their carers and their communities illuminating and informing the health professionals and researchers alike what the priority challenges are and questions should be moving forward. Improving care and clinical trials leading to better health outcomes for those affected by brain tumours is very much Cogno's mission and I'm sure a collective goal for us all to aspire to. I wish you a wonderful and informative forum. Thank you very much. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the Patient Education Information Forum being held virtually in association with the 13th COGNO Annual Scientific Meeting. We're deeply grateful to our partner, the Brain Cancer Group, care to cure for their sponsorship of this forum. My name is William Williams. I've been a committee member of the Brain Tumor Alliance for the past four years, following the death of my wife, Lynette, from a glioblastoma in 2017. If you're unfamiliar with BTAA, we are a national support organization offering help to patients, carers, families, and friends who've been impacted by brain cancer in their loved ones. We operate a 24 seven helpline, 1800 857 221 for anyone to call who needs support. We also serve Australia's diverse population with three important publications translated into 10 prominent languages used widely in Australia's multicultural community, including the valuable resource, It's Okay to Ask. All our services are accessible via the website, btaa.org.au. I encourage you to subscribe to BTAA and receive a monthly e-news 
biannual magazine and connections to the International Brain Tumor Association. There's a vast amount of information on the site, including details of support groups and other organizations to help you on this journey. With approximately 2,000 Australians diagnosed with a brain tumor each year, it means every five hours, someone will receive this unwelcome news. It's also a deadly disease with approximately 1,500 patients dying from the disease in any given year. This is why the dedication of highly trained neurosurgeons, neurologists, oncologists, and other medical scientists and allied health practitioners involved in the COGNO is so important to better treatment and support for patients and their loved ones. On behalf of BTAA, I give thanks to all those committed to this cause, especially those who have given their time voluntarily to present at this forum. I encourage all the participants to ask any questions that are on your mind. There is no such thing as a wrong question. Make the most of this opportunity and have a good day. Okay, our first presenter is Dr. Liz Ahern. Dr. Ahern is a medical oncologist at Monash Health and Dr. Ahern will go through an insider's guide to clinical trials. Um, thanks so much, um, Marina, and thank you to the um, to the organisers for asking me today. Um, I'm coming to you today from um, the lands of the Boon people of the Kulin Nations, and I too would like to extend my respect um, to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. Um, my name is Liz. Just a bit about me. So I'm a medical oncologist. I'm a relatively junior medical oncologist, and I um, graduated with my letters a couple of years ago in 2019. Um, and during that time, I also got a PhD up in Queensland in tumour immunology. So that's my real interest. Um, in terms of what I do now, I work half time at Monash Health as an oncologist and half time as a researcher at Monash Uni. And in terms of my clinical work, I do lots of clinical trials. Um, so that's um, neuro oncology trials, but also some other ones like lung cancer and phase one. Um, and so really my main aim today um, was to try to sort of help um, for you um, to demystify, I guess, some of the procedures, processes, and even just language surrounding clinical trials. Um, because I know this is a fairly daunting um, area and it's one that we're all very, very interested, but I think that can, it, can be, um, it can be a lot, you know. Um, following me this morning, you're gonna be hearing from two um, real superstars, I think, um, of different parts of the um, brain research field in Australia. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll have Jim Whittle, sorry, I'm trying to work my screen, yep. Um, Jim Whittle, who um, will be talking a little bit about clinical research um, and then Associate Professor Misty Jenkins, um, who will be talking about um, some of her preclinical research, which is aiming for clinical research. What I wanted to do as a sort of like a lead into their, um, to their presentations was to um, give some information about how clinical trials work just in general terms. So as I've sort of alluded to there, there's a few different types of research when we talk about cancer research. There's preclinical research, which really sort of um, relates to things that are done in the lab before making it into the clinic. Um, so that's like setting the groundwork for a clinical trial and, and making the discoveries that we think look exciting enough to go forward into a clinical trial. And then in terms of clinic, clinical research or research with patients, the one that I'm really going to focus on is, is, is clinical trials, which are um, when we really assess um, the safety and how good um, a new treatment um, might be um, for a particular disease. Um, and so a treatment is usually a drug, a new drug, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a drug. It can be a supportive care intervention or sometimes, for example, something to do with sequencing or types of radiotherapy, for example. Um, but mainly today, I'm going to sort of talk about in the, the um, drug um, clinical trial research, but just know that it, it can be a bit more broad than that. So the, for us as doctors, um, we, we can be involved at many different parts of the, pharmacolo 
the, the pharmacology and pharmaceutical drug development process. And as you can see in this little um, schema here, um, I don't want you to, to try to read it exhaustively, but just to understand that um, getting a new treatment or a new drug um, from the lab into the clinic, um, and this is an American sort of um, schema here as well, can actually take many, many years, um, heaps of money, and many, many patient volunteers and also scientists and clinicians to get there. And there's this estimation that there can be many thousands of potential discoveries in the lab and potential compounds that need to be tested to really sort of focus down into one um, drug that might work and might end up going into the clinic. And overall, the drug development cost um, is, is really massive for that. Unfortunately, in oncology, we do have one of the lowest um, rates of drugs making it through from the beginning of the clinical trial process into widespread clinical usage, which is unfortunate. And I think it's particularly difficult in brain cancer as well because of some of the um, aspects of brain cancer therapy, such as the blood-brain barrier, which has really made it difficult for drugs to show benefit in these diseases. So um, it is brain cancer is a particularly um, tough nut to crack. Then in Australia, we've got the additional um, processes that I guess bureaucratic processes as well of um, a drug coming, say it's been um, used and, and it's been licensed overseas. Then we've got to go through the process here, obviously, of getting it approved by the Therapeutic Drugs Authority. And then hopefully to get listed on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which is when the government decides that the drug is safe and effective and cost effective, and they will, um, they will subsidize some of the cost of that drug to make it more, um, more um, usable for us, I guess, in a financial sense. So um, I guess overall, it's a really long process and one that's got lots and lots of pitfalls in it. So what I'm going to sort of run through today quickly is um, topics of understanding different types of um, clinical trial designs and some terminology and the types of treatments that you might um, be offered in a clinical trial. How do you find a clinical trial? Um, questions about deciding to take part in a clinical trial, which can be a, a, a complicated and very personal process, I think. Um, how to join a study and what happens when you join a study. And then what happens if you do get onto a study um, during the study and at the end of the study as well? So just starting off by talking very briefly about some concepts in tr clinical trial design. This is a pretty busy slide, and I got this from a great resource at Cancer Australia called Understanding Clinical Trials and Research. Which you can Google, and I really recommend, um, if you're interested, to, to have a little look at it online, this booklet that they've um, published. Um, for us in the clinics, we may be involved in all different phases of clinical trials from phase one through to phase four. Um, and these trials have got various um, cohort sizes. So, for example, in phase one trials that I do, very few patients may be um, numbered in the tens all the way through to the later phase clinical trials where we might have hundreds or thousands of patients. Um, we also um, increasingly have this concept of phase zero clinical trials. And actually, um, Dr. Whittle, who's going to talk to us next, is, is really an expert um, and very interested in this sort of trial as well. And this one, I think, is particularly interesting for brain cancer because it's really a trial which is designed to assess whether or not a drug really makes it to where we want it to go. And I think that that's a major topic in brain cancer research. But why, for you as the patient, why is it important um, to have some kind of understanding about these phases of clinical trials? I guess there's these features of the different phases of clinical trials, which would really affect the sorts of treatments that you would get offered in the clinical trial. So as you get more later through the phases from phase one towards phase three, what it means is that the drug has been more and more studied in people. And so a, a, a drug, for example, that's in phase one, this would be the first time humans have had this drug. And so we're just trying to check that it's safe and we're hoping to see that it um, shows some effect on the tumor as well. 
by the time it gets to phase three and phase four, um, this is actually looking like a drug that is very, that, that is potentially effective. And so we're trying to check it against what we already have as being the best other alternative option at the moment. But there's these other features as well with um, clinical trials um, designs, which I'll just go through now, which, which also affects the sort of treatments that you'll get. So this is to do with um, whether or not you're on an open label or blinded study, or if you're on a randomized study or not. Um, so what does that mean? So um, if you're on an open label study, and that's often um, one of the very early phases, um, the study team and you as the participant know what you're getting. Um, so we actually know that you're on the active drug and everybody is aware of that. Whereas if you're in a later phase trial and, and it's blinded, um, that means that sometimes the study team and also yourself don't actually know what intervention arm you're in in the trial, which is to say, we're not absolutely sure what treatment you're getting. Also, some um, trials can be randomized. And what this means is that the trial groups are randomly allocated. So if you're offered a randomized clinical trial, that usually means that something like a computer code is used um, to randomly allocate you into one of two arms or one of many arms. And so that really means that your trial team that you're going to virtually always really has no um, influence over what type of treatment you're going to be getting in the trial because it's totally randomized. What sort of treatments might you get offered in a clinical trial? So um, you might get the active intervention. So that's actually the drug that's being studied. So that's good. So, so um, you might be um, definitely allocated to the drug that's being, um, that's being studied. Sometimes there can be an, a control arm, which is for comparison, and, and that could typically be the standard care. So um, you might be in a clinical trial, but actually be allocated to the currently known best treatment as you might get otherwise off the trial. Um, and then there's a third type of treatment, which I think it's really important to understand, which is placebo. So some trials can also be um, randomized with a placebo arm. And this is typically to be used in a situation where we're not sure if any drug works. And so a placebo is sometimes called a sugar pill. Um, it's really um, a non-active um, treatment, um, which is just there um, to help us um, avoid any biases um, and to um, understand if the people who are getting the active drug are genuinely benefiting and, and there's no bias in the study. Um, one one um, theme, I think, in terms of types of treatments in a clinical trial that I sometimes see thinking about access to the investigational product after the trial ends. And so that's a tip from me to, to all patients out there who are thinking of going on to a clinical trial is just to have a little think about looking into the patient information or asking the investigator about um, if, the, um, if the drug or the intervention is helping you, um, what is the um, arrangement for continuing to access that even after the clinical trial might end? Who writes the clinical trial? So that can be lots of different groups. So it can be individual investigators like me or Jim or Misty um, that you're hearing from this morning. It can be collaborative groups like Cogno or it can be universities. Many times it's actually industry such as pharma or biotech companies. And the, the trials can be funded by grants through national research organizations like the NH and MRC or charities or fundraisers, hospitals, um, and also industry trials are often funded by private funding as well. So, so by the pharma companies themselves. But all of these clinical trials, no matter who has written them and who is funding them, you should know that they, um, by the time they get into our hospitals and into our clinics, they have been reviewed by an ethics committee and a government governance committee to make sure that they are ethically, logistically and scientific sound. And, 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 and that's um, in relation to certain best practice standards, such as good clinical practice and the NH and MRC guidelines. They're also registered with the um, TGA for the Australian government. Um, and that sort of covers all different aspects of, um, of ethics of the trials, such as um, privacy for you as the participant and also data security. 
So moving on quickly, how do you find a clinical trial? So there's lots of different ways. I recommend just starting off by talking to your specialist in the first instance. Um, you can also always ask for a second or third opinion from other people in the field, for example, at, at the same hospital or other hospitals. Peer support such as the BTAA would be a good way of linking up and hearing about trials that are coming out. Um, clinical trials websites, such as some of those that I'm showing on the screen here, such as Cancer Council, um, ClinTrial Refer, Australian Cancer Trials and Cogno, um, uh, all of these websites would be good um, places to go to have a look for, for trials that might be relevant for you. Always ask your specialist if, if they think that this is something that, that could be right for you and if they can, if so, if they would consider referring you for, for that. Um, and and, and it, my special tip here is that you don't have to join a study at your own treatment centre. So your doctor is allowed to refer you to a trial somewhere else at another hospital, for example. Deciding to take part in a clinical trial, I think is really individual. Um, it's very nuanced. Um, and, and there's lots of things that you need to think about um, pros and cons when you're doing that. And I just wanted to put up a few ideas in that respect here. So um, I wanted to start off by thinking in terms of benefits and risks. Um, so in terms of benefits, when, when I think about offering a trial to patients, I think, you know, if this is actually a treatment that's going to work, then my patients who go on to the trial are going to be amongst the first in the world to actually benefit from this new treatment. So that's really exciting. Sometimes a trial can help you access expensive drugs as well too, which aren't yet listed on the PBS, So, which is to say they aren't yet affordable to the vast majority of patients. Also, I think many um, patients tell me that they feel good about being in clinical trials as well because they know that they're participating in research which might help other people in the future. However, it's not a guarantee that it's going to help you, um, which is important to know. So, um, just like standard treatments that we have already in the clinic, even if this new treatment works for other people, it may not work for you, unfortunately. And sometimes these trials are also trying to figure out why that might be. Also, this new intervention might actually not be better than what we already have. And so that's a risk that we have to take. And also, obviously, side effects can occur as well. And, and that's the case with really anything we do in terms of drugs and treatment and that sort of thing. It's important to think about your care team. So who will be caring for you during the trial? And for day-to-day -day issues, that's generally the investigator team, the people who are running the trial. And you would normally have a clinical trial coordinator that you can contact for day-to-day -day questions. It's important to know if you can still see your usual doctor. And, and that's usually the case. You can still usually see your own usual doctor if you want to as well. Um, and then in terms of commitments, I think it's really um, important just to think about that as well. So what's what will be required of you and for how long? Um, are there any additional procedures that are required? So sometimes, this is less so in brain cancer, but sometimes um, they will ask you to donate um, a, a tissue biopsy, for example. Um, are there special scans or other tests? If that's the case, typically they should be covered. So you shouldn't have to be out of pocket for any of those sorts of things. How often will you actually need to travel up to the hospital or clinic to be seen? And I know that during COVID, that's a major issue for some people. And will any of the out-of-pocket expenses be reimbursed um, for those sorts of visits, such as car parking? So deciding to take part in a clinical study really revolves around weighing up all those benefits and risks and all of those considerations. And it's really an individual thing. Everybody's different and has a different take on it. So I got these quotes off a, a patient um, a discussion board really, um, and it shows all different voices of patients when thinking about clinical trials. Um, some people say I'm very willing to be in it. Some say I'm, I'm turned off by some of the, um, by some of the um, logistics and things that they had to do. Will participating in the trial be much more inconvenient? And what are the advantages advantages which outweigh that. This requires a lot of thought. But then some other people say it was worthwhile going on to the trial because I was able to access the treatment and I also felt that I was contributing to the research as well. So there's, there's a sort of idea about all different flavours of, of what people think about it. If you do um, find a study and you think you'd like to um, consider joining it, this is typically what will happen. So you'll go through an informed consent process. 
This means that you'll be given some patient information about the study. Um, this should be written um, uh, and you should have a reasonable amount of time to, to look at that yourself and also discuss it with others. And you're allowed to discuss these patient information forms with whoever you want to and whoever you need to that would help you make a decision. And that can include um, your partner, um, family or friends, even your GP or your own specialist that you're seeing at the moment are, are really good support people to discuss it with. If you do agree to try to join the clinical trial, you will get an, a written agreement in writing relating to that as well. And then the, um, the investigator team will have to check to make sure that you're eligible for the trial as well. And so we have something called eligibility criteria. Unfortunately, these are pretty strict and specific and can often mean that you've got to jump through a lot of hoops, I guess, to get onto the study in terms of things like doing scans and blood tests. There's usually a whole list of inclusion criteria and you've got to meet every single one of those. And then there's another list of exclusion criteria and you're not allowed to have any of those. So exclusion criteria for brain cancer trials might include that you've got other medical problems which might make this, this trial unsafe for you or sometimes they'll say you have to have a minimum amount of steroids that you're taking every day, for example. What happens during the study? So the study's run by this protocol, which is really fairly um, strict and it's prescriptive. And it tells us every step along the way, um, what treatment you should be getting, how we should manage side effects, and when we should be um, assessing your disease, say with an MRI scan to see how it's going. It's really important to keep up the communication with your study team and also your usual um, team as well too. And, and so the trial investigation team should really um, be taking care of that. It's really important that everybody understands that withdrawing from a clinical trial is allowed at any time for any reason or even no reason. And that's fine. Nobody's gonna be upset with you and you don't get a penalty for that. And it doesn't limit your future care either. So you are allowed um, to withdraw from a clinical trial at any time if you don't feel like it's working well for you. After the trial ends, you usually return to your usual treatment with your usual doctors, but the investigating team might, might stay in touch with you to hear how you're going. So just my final slides is that I just wanted to talk about, I guess, some controversies and some difficult areas that I as a clinician sometimes see from my patients. So we're obviously living in a global world and everybody's got the internet these days. And so um, people sometimes talk about joining a clinical trial at, elsewhere such as interstate and also overseas and I think we can perhaps talk about this in the discussion but this is a really complicated question and it's to do with things like how hopeful is the treatment being studied and on the other hand what is really the burden in terms of um, the, the massive expense you know of, of going overseas for a study. Accessing clinical trials as well can be really um, tricky um, depending on factors such as living regionally, rurally or remotely, unfortunately. Um, and Jim, I think, is going to talk next about access to genomic testing. So that's another issue that we can perhaps talk about in the discussion. And unfortunately, all these things um, lead to the fact that traditionally there has been inequities in clinical trial participation, which is, which is really disappointing. And so this can be on the basis of things like race or gender or locality, you know, for rural or regional people as well too. I just wanted to finish off by um, saying, um, where can you get support or find more information about any of these issues that I've spoken about today? Um, so there are some useful websites there, both Australian and international. Obviously, um, some local support groups for you would include the Brain, Cancer, the Brain Tumor Alliance of Australia and the Cancer Council as well. So thanks so much for your, um, for your attention. I hope that this was in some way um, useful or informative. I know that was a lot of information going really quickly, um, but hopefully it's helped set the scene for, the, for our superstar speakers to come this morning. So thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. That was a great talk. It gave us an informative view of clinical trials. Uh, just to mention, we do have chat sessions going on and we'll try to um, answer questions in the Q&A session. So if you do have uh, Q&A session at the end around 11.40, if we go to time. So if you do have questions, please uh, pop it in the chat 
area and we'll try to go through those down the track. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jim Whittle, who's a medical oncologist at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Uh, Dr. Whittle will go through the role of genomics for personalised treatment in brain cancer, current trials in Australia and overseas. Thanks very much, Jim. Thanks very much, Marina. And um, thanks very much for the um, invitation to speak this morning on a really fantastic panel with Liz and Misty. Um, it's great to be here with uh, members of the Brain Tumor Alliance and the broader neuro-oncology community um, as part of the Cogno um, annual scientific meeting this week. Liz has given a really great introduction to um, what I'm hoping to cover um, this morning in, in quite a brief um, 20 minutes, but one, there's some, some material that I wanted to go through. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist at Peter Mac in the Royal Melbourne Hospital and also a laboratory head at WEHI, um, where um, we've recently established a brain cancer research program with uh, two other lab heads, Dr Saskia Freytag and Dr Sarah Best. So the focus of my talk um, that um, sort of follows on from Liz's um, fantastic introduction was you know, why do we need more clinical trial opportunities in brain cancer and how can we work towards this cancer moonshot and dealing with, you know, a really significant issue for brain cancer. In particular, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the genomics of brain cancer and specifically what is precision medicine or personalised oncology and where are we at in the field um, for this at the moment? hopefully um, helping you to answer a question. Should I have molecular testing on my tumour and what are the implications from this? And then a little bit about clinical trials in brain cancer. And Liz has introduced an important question that was posed to us about should I travel overseas for a clinical trial? And we might be able to flesh that out a little bit more in the discussion. So I think often talks and papers in the field of brain cancer tend to focus on some of the negative aspects and, and the lack of progress over the last 20 to 30 years. But um, I'd much prefer to focus on, I think, what have been the significant developments and changes in science and care um, that have happened over the past 20 years. And a big part of this comes from an understanding of the biology and the science of brain cancer. I think we've also seen great strides in technology, in the fields of surgery, in radiation and, and imaging. There's been the development of a large group of national bodies you know, represented here by Cogno and the neuro-oncology community with, through the Brain Tumor Alliance and other groups. And these in turn have led to improvement in training, education and building a specific workforce to target the problems in brain cancer and ultimately leading to new clinical trials to change the field. Brain Tumor Alliance and Cogno have also been played really important roles in advocacy and funding. And I think we're really starting to see, you know, a critical mass. And this has been um, shown with the Australian Brain Cancer Mission and through the Medical Research Foundation to lead to increasing funding to the field that I think we're just on the cusp of making some hopefully significant discoveries in, that will change outcomes for patients. But ultimately, even if we don't have new drug, drugs, patient care has markedly improved over the past 20 years. And a big part of this is through a multidisciplinary approach, focusing on the treatment of disease related symptoms and care coordinators and palliative care involvement um, that really improves quality of life. All of these have led to incremental improvements. So improvements in treatment, and I always start with surgery because I think surgery still remains the most important part of um, the majority of brain cancer care. Have, we've seen you know, significant improvements over the past 20 years. And Professor Kate Drummond, who's in the panel in the second half of the session, is really a leader in this. And these can include the use of awake surgery and bringing technology into the theatre, such as an intraoperative MRI and ultrasound to improve surgical resection. The radiation oncologists have also introduced new changes to treatment, for example, the gamma knife and stereotactic radiosurgery which has enabled the delivery of more targeted therapy to re hopefully reduce some of the long-term side effects from radiation treatment. But what about systemic therapy and biology, which is where I sit as a medical oncologist? I think it's useful just to turn to another cancer 
um, for some examples of, of what can happen if we understand the biology and the science of a cancer and that can change how we treat. So metastatic melanoma, which is obviously a big burden in Australia, um, just 10 years ago was essentially inevitably incurable. However, through uh, groups working together to understanding the disease biology, we've seen the development of targeted therapies and immunotherapy and really looking forward to Misty's discussion on the role of the immune system in brain cancer later. But in melanoma, these changes have meant that now we are starting to even talk about cure for a large proportion of patients with metastatic melanoma. And this really motivates me as a scientist and as a clinician to better understand brain cancer and therefore bring new clinical trials to the clinic. But it is important that we do acknowledge that in glioblastoma, the most common type of brain cancer for adults, in the last 30 years, there is only one trial of systemic therapy that has unequivocally shown a survival benefit. The Stuck protocol, which would be familiar to many people, established a new standard of care, but was only of modest benefit and hasn't changed since 2005. So we need new discoveries and new clinical trials to try and push this paradigm further. Liz gave a great introduction to the clinical trial pipeline and how scientific discoveries move through these phases, traditionally from phase one, phase two, and phase three, and then hopefully towards registration. But noting that less than one in 10 of these agents will actually make it through to the registration phase, and unfortunately in glioblastoma, nothing since temozolomide. And this has spurred a, a big field in not just brain cancer, an important sort of development over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, not just in the field of brain cancer, but in all cancers is precision medicine or personalized oncology, which although is a very elegant concept, it does have complex implications. And this flow diagram on the left explains what I'm, what I'm talking about in personalized oncology or precision medicine. This is where a patient will have their individual tumor and we will remove the DNA and the RNA to try and understand if there's any particular tumor pathways which are disrupted. We can then compare these to databases. And then the goal is to identify particular pathways or targets that we might be able to treat with a drug. And then this drug can then be delivered to that patient. And ultimately we hope to lead to a better outcome. This is a great concept in theory, but I think often can lead to higher expectations than what is the, the, the reality at the, at the current stage of development. And unfortunately, precision medicine does not apply universally or equally across cancer and also within cancer types. And there's a significant issue regarding equity. And this um, relates to the financial toxicity of both doing the testing and also ultimately accessing the drugs, which can be quite complicated and tricky. And finally, although this is a great concept, there is a lack of data for you know, widespread clinical implementation in brain cancer currently. But that really means that we just need to keep pushing the field forward, both with the community and in our laboratories and clinics. So this brings me to an important question about precision medicine and personalized oncology. Why should you order a genomic test? So the most important and first is when I think about this is to identify a treatable genomic result. And this is what we would refer to as a predictive biomarker where we can find a result that would then identify a matched treatment option. But similarly, a biomarker might predict resistance and tell you a drug that you shouldn't use, whether that's a standard of care therapy like chemotherapy, or whether it's a novel therapy that's being tested in a clinical trial. These biomarkers can also be useful in helping us predict outcomes and be able to give patients and their families more information about what the future might hold. And these prognostic biomarkers are all just as important as predictive. We can also understand better about where a cancer might have started, and that will help us decide on what the best treatment might be. And finally, although this is really in a nascent phase for uh, brain cancers, these biogenomic tests can also be useful to monitor treatment response and help us predict what might the next treatment option be. 
And there's a lot of information that goes into determining whether a particular gene is a cancer gene, okay, is associated with, you know, the development and the progression of cancer. And this is informed by a wide variety of evidences, right from laboratory studies or preclinical evidence through to clinical evidence from patient testing and clinical trials or the patterns of mutations that might come together. We also have learned a lot about cancer from studying cancers which occur in families and the um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes associated with breast and ovarian cancer are probably the two most well described and understood. All of this feeds into large databases and more than 500 and up to 1000 of genes can be associated with cancer. But before you go about sort of, one, you know, talking about genomic sequencing, and this is, these are the things that I like to consider in discussions with um, patients is, what do you need to think about first? And number one is, what do we already know? And what that is, indicates is that standard of care testing in the clinic, what is routinely done by pathologists, already gives us a lot of information, both about predictive and prognostic biomarkers. And some of these names might be familiar to you, such as mutations in IDH or MGMT methylation, which are routinely used. Second question is, what are we looking for? And to know this, we need to understand the genomic changes which are common in brain cancer, which is beyond um, the scope of my talk this morning. And then thirdly, what test should I choose? And that is uh, requires an understanding of what are the requirements for testing, and also what the limitations for testing might be. This flow diagram gives a bit of an understanding of what actually might happen to a tumor sample or blood sample to do a genomic test. And as you can see, we can do genomic tests both on tumor samples that are taken at the time of an operation or a biopsy, or increasingly also what we would refer to as a liquid biopsy. And that might be blood, saliva, even cerebral spinal fluid, even urine can give us information about a cancer as well. And these tumours are usually fixed in formalin and then looked at under a microscope by a pathologist. And they look at the protein by doing immunohistochemistry. And this information or these slides can then be used to extract DNA or we can snap freeze a tumour in liquid nitrogen to preserve the DNA. Cancer cells can also escape from the, the primary cancer site and enter the blood. And this is in a, a, currently in a research uh, phase for brain cancers, and we can extract DNA in these form for genomic testing as well. And over the past 10 years, there's been a huge um, boom of different types of um, commercial uh, testing platforms, both available here in Australia in an academic setting and also commercial setting. And it is important that we acknowledge there is money to be made here, and that means there is significant commercial involvement. And before deciding on what test to do, you know, the clinician in discussion with their family, the patient and their family needs to describe the multiple types of testing, the cost, which is significant and can range between $2,500 and $7,500 and a significant turnaround time to actually get the result. And finally, where might the extra support and independent review be to help predict what the information um, comes out on the other side? And ultimately, what tests to order depends on what we're looking for. And this ranges from a whole scope just by looking at a single gene of interest or several genes or a panel of genes that can be up to 100s through to looking at the entire genome. And depending on what test to order, depends on what you are trying to achieve and what you're trying to learn from that test. And generally speaking in the clinic, we're probably on this side of the equation using small panels or single genes, which are targeted questions where we really know what we're looking for, as compared to doing a whole genome study, which is slower, but gives us more detail. And typically at the moment is more restricted to research use. And the results might give us different types of information and um, that may or may not be relevant to cancer treatment. And this is a, um, a concept of what we call passenger and driver mutations. 
And passenger mutations are those mutations which don't drive cancer initiation progression. So they're really unrelated to the cancer development and are just a biomarker of the genomic instability that happens within the normal setting and particularly within cancers. And this compares to driver mutations. And these are the ones which are really important. These are the mutations which drive the initiation and progression of cancer and often the resistance to treatment. And this is where we wanna ask the question, can we switch off these mutations and pathways with a targeted therapy or drug? But again, what do we need to consider as well before going ahead? I think importantly, the test might not work and about 10 to 15% of these uh, genomic tests will fail. And still, although, as I said at the outset, this is a great concept, in the majority of patients, it's not going to actually change treatment decisions. And it may help, but in the majority of people, it's not helping. It also might create a lot of frustration and stress by create, indicating a treatment which is not yet available in Australia. Or if that treatment is available, it can be associated with significant cost up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It also might indicate hope with a treatment, but that has limited evidence of benefit in brain cancer. And the findings might also have implications for your family's future cancer risk that are important to be discussed as well. So where are we at to for targeted therapy and brain cancers? And I just put in two examples here because I think sort of, I can't cover all of these, but these are two examples of um, mutations which can happen in brain cancer and other types of cancer. For example, a BRAF mutation, which happens in about one to 50% of brain cancers, but, and we can treat it with a particular target or a BRAF inhibitor, but this doesn't, just because you've got the mutation, doesn't mean that it works in everyone. So only about 20 to 30% of patients will be receive benefit from the treatment. Similarly, there's a, a newer type of um, mutation which people are talking about called NTRAK, N-T-R-A-K, where these mutations are, are less frequent and responses for patients who have brain cancer, these mutations are in the order of 50%. And, you know, what we need to be developing as a, as a community is really trying to understand how we can find the people who are going to benefit, how we can enhance testing, and so that we have more equitable access to genomic testing, you know, across patients and all types of brain cancer, so that we can find those people who are going to derive the most benefit from treatment. And just switching tack a little bit more to sort of clinical trials now, and, and Liz really gave a great overview of trying to balance the risk of hope for response and benefit from a treatment versus the potential toxicity. And toxicity is not just what the drug might do, but it's the burden of coming to lots of appointments and um, additional follow-up that you might not have in standard of care. And... In terms of Australian brain cancer trials, the COGNO is you know, really leading the, the, the development of brain cancer trials in Australia. And this is by bringing large groups together across Australia so we can put as many people on possible and really understand the science and progress the field forward. And COGNO has led a number of phase two and three, phase three trials over the past 10 years, which have been practice changing. And these include the Cabaret, the Virtu and the Nutmeg study, and currently the MAGMA study, which is using a really novel design um, to enrol patients across Australia and answering important questions in the field. And we also have a large number of sponsored trials, and these are typically um, funded by biopharmaceutical companies investigating the new drugs. And I, at this stage of development, we're really looking mostly at phase one and phase two studies, trying to identify new targets and new treatments. And so typically these occur in large referral centres and may reduce access, as Liz has indicated, for um, patients in rural, regional and remote settings. There's also been significant development in precision medicine trials. For example, the MOST platform, which is led out of um, St Vincent's and the Garvin in Sydney and is across Australia now, is really trying to push the envelope in the 
form of personalised oncology where patients' tumours are tested through these sequencing platforms that I've described to try and identify if there is a drug or an immunotherapy that might benefit our patients. And these options, and this is really improving access to both just not just the testing, but also access to new drugs. And I'm really hoping these types of trials will continue to increase. What about travelling overseas for clinical trials? And you know, as a clinician, these are, these are questions that are often asked um, and, and we often have discussions. I think there's some important things to consider. And again, beyond the scope of this talk, all the discussion to answer any specific questions about specific clinical trials, but these general points are important. Most will be experimental. And I think we do need to remember that you know, not all phase, drugs that are tested in phase one and the majority are not going to make it through. But obviously there will be some. We always need to be aware of the hype and the N equals one story. That is the outcome that someone tells you about a friend or a you know, colleague who had a great experience and therefore this is the only option for you. We need to remember that ethics review is not standard across the world and the rigorous human um, ethics committees that happen um, locally in Australia are not always consistent. And there is a significant opportunity cost, not just the financial cost, but also being away from family and supports. We also need to be aware that sometimes you can access drugs which are available overseas without actually going through compassionate drug access programs as well. And um, pharmaceutical companies working with clinicians and patients um, are doing this more and more. This gave a great slide and introduce, and it's more information about where to go, but broadly speaking, emphasising that it's best to speak to your oncologist and other treating team members. And you can get information from clinical trial groups. Brain Trim Alliance has a great web page and resource list for clinical trials, and there's other websites that you can look to. The reason why it's always great to go back to your oncologist is sometimes this information is not completely up to date, and it's not clear that it's particularly relevant to your setting. So in, in summary, there's been significant developments in the field of brain cancer and the understanding of biology is going to continue to guide new treatments. But currently the science has probably outpaced our drug development and there are still issues with access, which is not equitable. But ultimately clinical trial is good medicine is good medicine. It provides opportunities, there's rigorous monitoring and care, and it does help move the field forward. But this isn't for everyone. Not everyone needs to go on a clinical trial to get great care. And I think that's also really important that the, the care that you're going to get at standard in Australia is first class and is as good as you get anywhere else in the world. So with that, I'm going to finish and look forward to answering questions later in the discussion. Thanks very much, Jim. Again, as Jim said, there have been some questions come through the chat um, room if you want to ask questions uh, that we can talk about at the end of the next session. So the next session will be uh, Associate Professor Misty Jenkins. She's the labor laboratory head at Walter Eliza Hall Institute, and she'll be talking about targeting the immune system in brain cancer. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marina. Thanks so much for the introduction and, and thanks so much for having me um, here to come and speak to you today. Um, really what I want to do is, is I'm going to shift tack a little bit and talk about the preclinical work um, that happens um, before we get to the clinic. And to, you know, because in order to take things through to the clinic, Jim's just really nicely outlined um, clinical trials and, and, and Liz's talk as well. This will build on that but at the start of that pipeline and tell you what sort of goes into how we can bring new things to the clinic in the first place, which is uh, which is where we want to get to. So I'm from the WEHI, the Walter and Liza Hall Institute of Medical Research, and this is a, a, one of Australia's oldest medical research facility that sits just behind the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I'm a cancer immunologist, um, for those that don't me, so don't know me, so I'm here to talk about T cells. Now, we all have T cells zooming around our body, through our blood and our lymph and our tissue and in our brain. And, and this is just a beautiful microscopy image of a real living T cell crawling across the dish. 
And in the movie on the right hand side, you can see the T cell attaching to a cancer target. Um, and so the job of T cells in our body is to zoom around our body and find um, malignant, infected, transformed, dangerous cells, and ultimately deliver the kiss of death and take them out. So this is happening in our body all the time. Um, and so the lethal hit towards the target is directed um, um, by the, the, this T cell shown here in red, directs this little red dot, the centrosome, sort of like the laser-like definition, and then onto the target here in this blue target, you'll see blow up and these T cells deliver these, a payload of toxic granules as shown here in red, uh, which killed the target. Now, when we're designing living T cell therapies, of course, one T cell and one target doesn't make for a very efficient immune response. And we want one T cell to be able to take out loads of targets. And that's as great because they are serial killers. So these T cells will quickly see deliver the kiss of death to one, two, three, four, five targets in very quick succession. So they're quite efficient when they're doing their job properly and they're able to go around and kill the cancer cells. And so um, in recent years, we've been looking at using these and manipulating them to use as a living therapy. Now, sometimes, of course, you know, the cancer cells are invisible to the immune system. And so that's what happens here. This is a T cell here trying to kill this cell and it's just not dying. Um, and because the T cell isn't able to deliver the right kiss of death. And so what happens here is then um, sometimes you can get a buildup of inflammation. Um, and so, um, or it's just completely invisible to the immune system. So, you know, having cancer and not having cancer is sometimes the difference between that, that, that war and, and when, the, you know, when the immune system is losing the war and, in, in, and, it, and the cancer is invisible to your own immune system, um, then, then um, you know, so some drugs, you know, so you'll hear about like checkpoint markers are um, drugs which enable to sort of wake up a sleepy immune system because a lot of tumours will send your immune system to sleep and sort of make it invisible to, to it. Um, and so that's great if you already have that pre-existing immune response to your tumour and, and, some, and some patients do. But in the case um, of brain cancer, this is a bit more tricky and a lot of patients don't have it. Um, but also then what we can do is we can create it. We can actually engineer it from a patient's own immune system. And so this is um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cells. So we're essentially taking patients' own T cells and beefing them up and making them into a Mr. T cell, which is a cultural reference point lost on the younger members of the audience. Um, but those of you familiar with the A team, that's really what we're doing. So we're creating a living, a living drug. Now, you know, when we think about cancer therapy and cancer treatment, it's really been founded on these three pillars. And Jim has already really nicely outlined this. So we've been using surgery um, for, for, for centuries, actually, dating back to the ancient Egyptians. Of course, it, that's much more sophisticated now, as Jim's outlined. Radiation um, around the 1900s. And then, of course, chemotherapy. And you'll all be familiar with the Stuck protocol for brain cancer. And if, so immunotherapy has formed this fourth pillar of cancer treatment and the way that we can um, treat tumours uh, using the patient's immune system. Now, this is the most sciencey slide that I have, but it's essentially, if you sort of look at this line here across the middle, this is the membrane or the outside of, it, of a, the T cell. And what we're doing is we're able to give the patient this receptor. So this is sort of the key that's going to fit the lock of the tumour cell. And so this outside binding part is like the magnet. That's the key that's going to bind to the cancer cell. And then we can engineer this receptor with a whole bunch of these important signaling molecules that are normally found in a signaling T cell receptor, which is basically the kill signal. And this, this basically redirects the T cell um, to kill the cancer cell. And so this, this sort of approach has been used with great success in blood cancers. Um, so this is really the first paediatric patient that was treated on earth, Emily Whitehead. So you can see with these dates here how recent and cutting edge these therapies still really are. She was treated for a very aggressive, aggressive and refractory um, leukemia. And, um, and she's now, as of this year, still nine, nine years completely cancer free and has been cured of her cancer. So the, so the challenge for us is how can we take those success stories like Emily and, and translate them into the brain cancer space. And this, uh, these sort of facts and figures are not lost on this audience, I know. Um, and because new treatments are urgently required, both in the adult and also the paediatric setting for tumours like um, um, DIPG or you know, diffuse midline gliomas that grow, grow in the brain stem and are surgically inoperable um, because this is a part of the brain that can, controls your breathing and your swallowing. So they cannot be surgically removed. And so, you know, we need ways in which 
um, we can target these tumours specifically, uh, but leave the healthy brain cells unharmed. And that's sort of really the power of this immune response. Similarly, for, for tumours like glioblastoma, which we know is one of the most common tumours, but with the poorest survival. And so this is a really just a simple, a simple schematic of what this process looks like um, in the clinic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so after diagnosis, um, blood is taken from, from um, the patient where the T cells then are isolated from the blood. They're then grown up in addition. They're given that all important car, that killing receptor <clears throat> that's introduced to the cells. And then the cells are grown up um, in the lab and then they're infused back into the patient usually after a, um, some lymphoablations that sort of makes space for the new T cells. And then they're able to be delivered um, um, either through in the vein or, or straight into the brain and go in and kill and kill the tumours. And so, so what, this is what we've been doing at WeHi is then to build this pipeline so that we can rapidly now take this, these sort of approaches and build a pipeline to, to deliver this sort of personalised medicine for brain tumour patients. Now, this involves first knowing what to target on the, ta on the, on the, on the brain tumour cell. So what is the right key that's going to fit the lock? What is different about that tumour cell that's not, that you know, not going to kill a healthy cell? And so this is a really, in my mind, one of the most critically important pieces of the puzzle that we need to solve. And so we're doing this in my lab at WeHi. Once we identify what those targets are, we can then make those, those engineered receptors and then we, can, we go in into the lab and do a bunch of functional experiments to work out how well they can kill their targets, and then we can test them in, um, in, in mouse model. And we use mouse models for this. And this enables us to then look inside the tumour environment, look how the T cells are traffic, trafficking in and how well they can um, kill those brain tumours, and then with the plan to take that then into the clinic and be able to translate these into, into people. And so we did this with a very um, well, already well-characterised target called EGFRV3, um, and about 40% of glio adult glioblastomas um, have this mutation. And so by making our CAR T cells against this target, you can see here these little purple dots um, are brain tumours in mice and that we were able to completely clear and completely um, cure these mice of their brain tumours. And, and I'm proud to say that these are these cohorts still, um, you know, a year later still running around on the shelf very happily, happy um, and, and very much alive. So um, that's, that was really um, quite exciting for us to show that we could make these therapies from scratch and that they, were, that they were working. And so now the next question is, so how can we now put more tools in our toolkit? We need more keys to fit the locks. We need to know what, what are other targets that are present on the surface of these brain tumours we can target. And to date, this is something that hasn't had a lot of research um, in it, which is which is sort of where where um, I'm interested in in participating in this space because in particularly um, in in brain tumors there's been only a handful of targets identified, um, whereas there's been a lot of success um, in the blood cancer space and so this is this is really where we think we can make a big impact. Um, and in addition to that, we're also then um, looking at the interplay of how these cells. Um, get into the brain and how we can stop them getting um, um, made to be sleepy by the tumour. The tumour can shut down. It can be very immunosuppressive environments and shut down the, the immune response in the T cells. So to do this, we can use these little, um, uh, these little mice here and we can actually, they recover very well from this surgery and, um, and we can watch the tumours grow and then we can give our therapy and then really watch those tumours melt away and look at the interactions of those T cells and all of those other immune cells too. So this is a, a movie, we can take these longitudinally um, over, over a number of weeks. Um, and so these little uh, uh, yellow cells you can see here are the T cells. Um, infiltrating and then this big pink mass here is the tumour and so what we do is we take a very fancy microscope and this is in the living animal this is in the living mouse we can see single cell resolution of these yellow cells coming in and infiltrating and getting into that tumour and we can see it kill the tumour cells so this is um, the first time this has been applied in Australia, this technology. In fact, this is the only platform established to do this in the Southern Hemisphere. And we have this at Weihai and it's called a two photon microscope um, and, and using this to look at these little intracranial windows. And this is telling us a lot about the tumours. Um, this is the vasculature and the blood in the brain. And you can see this pink tumour here growing in this mouse. And we can then look at a depth um, down with the microscope, it go, can go quite deep into the brain and we're able to then really map what that really looks like. And so this is a really powerful platform because it enables us to then 
look at this environment um, and it's um, and the effect of all kinds of different drugs. So not just T cells, of course, but uh, lots of other therapies as well. And then we can also look at the role of these T cells with these um, what's shown as microglia here in green. So these T cells are in yellow. Um, the tumour is in red here. You can see those little T cells moving around. And then we can also see them interact with the green cells, which are the immunosuppressive cells, which shut down the T cells. And so by understanding those interactions too, we can then use other drugs in combination to then say give T cells, but also then to, sh um, to shut down and, and to really dampen down that suppressive immune response so that we can get the best robust immune response we can to attack these brain cancer cells. So, um, so CAR T cell therapy is a really important piece of the puzzle. So, you know, currently standard treatment is chemotherapy, um, radiation and, and surgery. But I think, you know, by using uh, CAR T cells, both, both with single receptors and I should say, with, with, you know, the, the, field, the, the field is getting quite fancy with its genetic engineering in terms of um, targeting multiple, multiple proteins at, at once. Um, and also being able to then get the T cells to locally secrete therapeutics right into the brain. Um, and, and, and so that of course helps with um, toxicity um, because you're getting, the, you're getting the effects right at the tumor site and not, not systemically throughout the body like you would, like you do with chemotherapy and other drugs. Um, and then we can also use this sort of T cell, CAR T cell therapy approach in combination with other um, biologics such as um, antibodies, called checkpoint inhibitors and other small molecules and drugs. Um, and there was a, um, a CAR-T plus PEMBRO trial completed earlier this year. And those, for, um, those are yet to be uh, reported, but I think, um, you know, there, there certainly is some, some hope here. And I just want to point out that one more thing before I finish, which is, um, you know, brain, in terms of all other solid tumours, brain cancer is actually the one, the one indication where there has been you know, good tumor regression in a patient treated with CAR T cells. And that's the only, the only real response in solid tumors that we've seen so far on planet earth. And it's been in brain cancer. So I think brain cancer really is leading the way in, in this area. Um, and I certainly think there's a lot more that we can do. And I'll just finish with this slide, which is, I think that sort of certainly here in Melbourne, there really is high potential for translation where um, in order to make these T cell therapies, they have to happen in a, in a very, um, you know, highly regulated special specialised facilities um, called clean rooms, and they have these at the VCC um, a, uh, with a company called Cell Therapies, um, we, and we're all connected by bridges. You know, there in Parkville, so it's very easy for us to have these therapies made now and to be able to translate them into the clinic. So I think there's a really huge um, opportunity to trans like, translate into the kinds of clinical trials that Liz and Jim have already nicely outlined this morning. So with that, I'll just. Um, thank my large team who contribute to all of this preclinical work uh, and none of this could happen without the important collaborators um, funding but also patients and their families. I should point out that um, you know in order for us to really find new targets on the brain tumours it does rely on accessing fresh tissue and so you know donated tissue from biopsies or surgeries you know when you have a tumour removed um, you know, instead of it going into the bin, it could actually go um, into a lab and, and that's how we actually find new targets and enable us to really help patients. So I just want to thank those patients for those generous um, tissue donations because they're absolutely critical to the work. Thank you. Okay. I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Misty. That was... Um... Fantastic. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, so now we're going into our Q&A session uh, before we wrap up um, the morning session, which will end around 12.15 for some lunch. Uh, we'll just have a look at there's been a few questions that have come into the chat room. Um, so I'll ask if all of you can um, give your opinion on this. So one of the questions was around, um, I suppose, genetics and should children be tested if a parent has been diagnosed with a primary brain tumour? Um, and, and I think relating to that, um, there was another question that came in um, asking about, you know, the fear of telling your children that they have a hereditary, hereditary tumour. Um, which they're not. So maybe all of you can give your views on this if you can. Um, or Jim, would 
Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll start then, sure. Um, so I think that's a really important question. And I think um, that came back to one of the uh, points I wanted to make. There's a lot of things to consider before going ahead with doing um, genomic testing or molecular profiling. And I think what that requires is, you know, a period of time and informed consent before signing a document that you're going to go ahead and do this and really understanding the potential benefits, whether that's identifying a new um, targeted treatment or a, a different biomarker and also the potential risks. And one of those potential risks being that they may identify a tumour which has implications for your family. Now, what would happen? And again, I think it's important to understand that the vast majority of brain cancers are not heritable. And I think I always really try and reassure people that, you know, the vast majority of this is not something that, that you've inherited or that you would pass on to your children. Um, however, sometimes the genetic test would find something which we know is associated with cancer. And if that happens, what will um, your team would refer you to speak to a specialist, what we call a familial cancer specialist, to talk about that in a little bit more detail and gather a little bit more information about family history and whether or not more testing is required. So I think it's important to know um, that there will be resources and follow up. And so any testing has to be done within that framework. And so just because you have a brain cancer doesn't mean that your family necessarily has to go out and get any extra tests, but in some, some instances and some um, scenarios, there will be a recommendation to do that. And, you know, this is all funded through, and, you know, the government and, and via familial cancer clinics across the country. Great. Thank you. Liz, did you have anything to add? Oh, look, um, not really. I mean, I think Jim's just covered it. So I think, you know, um, the, the vast majority of these mutations, these DNA changes and errors that we're looking for on the genomic sequencing is only in the tumour itself. It's not in your own DNA code, which is in every cell in your body that you can pass down to family members or that you've inherited from your mum and dad. Um, so most of the time, if something is found on the genomic test, if there's a mutation, that means that it's just in the tumour itself and there's not a chance, there's not a risk of that being also present in your family members, which is good. But as Jim has said, occasionally we can pick up rare family cancer syndromes. To be honest, you know, I think when I've seen these, it's usually in people who have a fairly strong history of many people in their family having all different cancers. And sometimes the, the patient themselves might have had multiple cancers themselves. And so that is when we start to really think about inherited syndromes. But if, if there's really not that history, um, in my view, to, I mean, obviously, as Jim has said, it's really, really critical to talk to your specialist and understand what you're signing up for. Um, but I think that the, the, the benefits at this stage in terms of, in, for most people, in terms of finding a, 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 a target that we might be able to treat or get you into a trial for usually outweighs the benefits. And, yeah, it's really important to know that most of these are not things that you're going to pass down to your children or anything like that. But that's a, I know it's a massive fear um, and it's a really complicated thing. So um, do feel free to ask questions again and again until you feel like you totally understand it. Thanks very much. Misty, did you want to add anything? I think that's covered really nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just there was another question that came through um, just in regard to the slides. So at the end of today's session, everybody who has uh, is a participant uh, will receive an email with a survey link if they can help us complete that. Uh, and I believe that um, after we've cleaned the video up a little bit, uh, today's session's up a bit, uh, it will be, be made as a video that will be available to everybody. I'd say it'll 
be uh, emailed out to participants and will be available on a YouTube sort of panel as well. So those slides will be available to people then um, as well. So just to clear that up. So just um, going back to a few questions that came in initially, um, some of them around the a GBM or glioblastoma, um, what uh, treatment is there after the tumour's progressed on the STUP protocol? So if somebody's had a recurrence of their tumour or the tumour has gone into, I'd say, the leptomeningeal area or the CSF, what treatment um, availabilities are, are there for patients? Um, yeah, so, you know, this is always a very um, difficult and disappointing situation, and I know that um, it's really hard for patients and their families and carers at this point. Um, there's no one answer to this question because it very much depends on the, 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 the details, I guess. So um, we think about issues like how long has it been since the STUP protocol was done? How has the recurrence occurred? So is it in one very localised spot or is it in many spots or, as Marina has just said, leptomeningeal, meaning the covering tissue of the brain? By and large, what we do, um, I think, we usually go back to first principles and, in, and think about all the different components of treatment and, and usually discuss it in a multidisciplinary team context as well with surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, radiologists, and so forth. And we really sort of tick down the list, you know, is, is salvage surgery an option? Is giving radiotherapy again an option? If, if we're not able to do any of those sort of local treatments, then we're looking at um, should we be doing any sort of what we call systemic treatment. So that could be things like um, on the PBS, there's um, various um, treatments like bevacizumab, which used to be known as Avastin, or there's chemotherapy options as well. There are also trials, and depending on where you are in the country, um, you could find trials by going to some of those websites and having a little look. Sometimes, unfortunately, when the tumour does progress and, and get worse, what we do find, um, and this is a difficult situation, what we do find is that sometimes people might be too unwell at that point to have any more, say, chemotherapy or other therapies as well. And at that point, it's really important for us um, to increase the um, contact with our, our um, colleagues in supportive and palliative care, which form a really important part of this process as well, and, and do things like making sure that the person with the tumour um, has the best quality of life and, and the, the lowest symptoms that we can, can, can get really for as long as we can get. So no, that's a long answer, and, and, and um, I know it's sort of unsatisfying, but... Um, it, unfortunately, there's no one, one answer to that question. There's no one thing that we always do. Um, it, it, it sort of depends, I think, on, on, on a lot of the details. Um, and so I don't know if Jim has anything else that he wants to sort of um, chip in and add to that answer. No, I think that's a great answer. And I think and one of the, the advantages and the progresses in the field is that we don't work in isolation and that we work as part of a multidisciplinary team so that it's always important to bring in all of those key players and to think about what's the best part of and what's the best approach forward and then to present them and those options and the recommendation. Thank you. Um, so just also talking about um, glioblastoma, this is probably more of a statistic, st statistical question um, asking around what percentage of brain cancer survivors experience a reoccurring tumour and when is the tumour most likely to recur? So that's a really broad question and it's, um, I think, the, the reality that we face is that for most adults with a brain cancer, excluding a meningioma or something else which might be removed with an operation, almost inevitably will progress at some point in the future. And so 
all of our treatments are designed to delay that progression and to maintain quality of life for as long as possible. But at this stage, we're not talking about cure for a large majority of um, brain cancers. And I think there's a wide variety of tumour types and information like grade, age, other health issues which impact on that. And I think it's best to, that's a sort of important discussion to have at an individual level probably rather than in this forum because I don't think we can give specific numbers that would be useful to anyone. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, again, still around, um, you know, uh, astrosotomas or, or GBMs. Um, what else can patients do to help themselves as such beyond um, getting the treatment or the standard of care treatment that we can offer? What other things can patients do to help themselves um, have better quality of life? Shall I take that one? Okay. Um, look, um, I'm the clinicians. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's a um, you know a superb question, and um, you know I think um, as clinicians we're always really um, we're always keen to to think about these these other details. I think it's easy to get focused on the drugs or the radiotherapy and that, and managing those side effects without sort of thinking about how do we continue to live um, with this problem and, and how do we keep ourselves as well as possible? So the sorts of things that I usually talk about with my patients um, is, um, so I think um, virtually all of my patients really um, experience fatigue as, as a major problem, either during or following treatment. And so I think that there is evidence that doing some, some modest exercise some aerobic exercise as tolerated is is really good for that and talk to your doctor obviously before embarking upon I don't want you to go out and join CrossFit tomorrow or F45 or something like that necessarily but um, but um, doing some even just walking or, or whatever to get that heart rate up is is shown there's good evidence to show that that can reduce fatigue and get you feeling better as well um, from a um, I guess in terms of your spirit or your psychological um, functioning. Lots of my patients benefit from mind-body interventions as well. So this, again, is not, um, unfortunately, can sometimes be a cost issue or an access issue for some patients, but there are online things. But by, by mind-body, I'm talking about things like meditation or, or yoga and, and those sorts of things as well. I, I know that um, this, this disease brings with it a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry. So those things, I think, can get you feeling a bit better in yourself while also addressing those aspects. I think people often ask about diet. You know, should I be eating um, a ketone diet or eliminating sugar altogether and all these sorts of things? And I think... Um, we can go a little bit too far in that perspective. I think the best evidence really is that just maintaining a, a, a broad, healthy diet according to usual dietary recommendations is really the best. Um, I know people focus on the gut microbiome a little bit and, and the evidence that's emerging in that respect is that it may, may influence the way our treatments work on the cancer in some situations, but that the best way to support that is just through a healthy diet. And I really don't encourage my patients to go on extreme diets like eliminating sugar entirely there's there's no evidence that you can starve um, the the tumor of sugar and that that'll make things better and you know I think that with this disease being as difficult as it is quite frankly um, we sort of want to take the time to enjoy the things that we like to do so have a good balanced diet and I, I encourage my patients to splurge every now and then as well um, uh, that's that's usually the sort of things I talk about. There's um, there's um, supportive interventions that you can get through cancer council, such as peer support as well, to to just help your I guess um, physical and mental functioning. And um, just finally to wrap up, I always um, think in my patients about. Um, is there a role to try to link them in with um, psychology or psychiatry support? Because again, going back to that thing about it being quite a stressful or anxiety provoking situation, or sometimes depression can happen as well too. So I think that being alert for these sorts of symptoms and talking about them with, with your doctor and seeking help um, 
uh, if you're feeling those things is really good as well. Great. Thanks very much. Anything from you, Jim? Look, um, no, I think that's great. And there's going to be an excellent session after yeah. lunch focused on supportive care, which I think there'll be some great resources. Look, I just wanted to pivot a little bit off that question and just reflect on one of the ones that was asked before, and, and that's how to get involved in research, both clinical and basic research. And I think it's important to know that, you know, more and more, um, you know, scientific research organisations and funding bodies really want research to be informed by consumers, both patients and their families who've experienced cancer, so that we can make sure that what we do is, you know, remains patient-centred and important to the community. So, you know, I think there's also ways that, um, you know, groups like Brain Tumor Alliance Australia and other advocacy groups are really pushing, pushing that forward. And I think as um, a clinician, as a scientist, I think, you know, when we're trying to answer questions, it's really important for us to ask the questions which are important um, to the community. Um, and um, there will be ways that you can get involved if that is something that you're interested in, you know, probably reaching out through Brain Tumor Alliance Australia. I know at we Hire, we have a consumer program um, which, you know, really informs a lot of what we do as well. And I'm not sure if Misty's had any personal experience, whether you, how you found that help um, with the work that you do in the lab as well. Yeah, the consumer programs are fantastic. So if anyone is interested, um, they can contact places like We High, and there are equivalent programs um, out there to, to be involved, to learn more about research. But also, you know, as scientists, we're also looking for ways to, you know, hear the, more about the patient experience, to work closely with the oncologists and the doctors and the surgeons um, so that, you know, so that, you know, we can design these therapies in a, in a co-design way that's a, that's a two-way exchange of information. And so, you know, um, it's through those conversations with with patients and their families that, it, you know, have able, you know, that really enabled us to, um, you know, to look at particular targets, for example, because they were coming up in, in some of their families' tumours. So, you know, those sorts of things can be really useful um, in a, in a two-way direction. Mm -hmm. I, I think I probably shouldn't be saying this, but, you know, I think from my perspective as a care coordinator, you know, the, the um, exercise, mental health, mindfulness, um, you know, supportive care stuff, clinical psychology, counselling is just as important as the treatment that you're receiving. So, and that's the stuff that really keeps you on an even keel. So a few more questions, this time probably around research. So I'm coming to you, Misty. Um, what do you think uh, from a research perspective should be taken as a matter of priority um, for, for GBMs or any brain tumours at the moment? And how do you think we're placed in Australia um, in regard to research that's done throughout the world? Do you think that we're on an even par? I think um, I think we're we're definitely um, coming up to being on an even par. We're not quite there yet, and and I say that because Australia still has never had a CAR T clinical trial for brain can of any kind of brain cancer. Um, so you know we're hoping really to change that um, here in Melbourne, particularly over the next even twelve months, twenty four months. Um, so so watch this space. Um, but certainly we are um, you know punching above our weight. Um, inter, you know, internationally in terms of publications and, um, and sort of cutting edge approaches. So in terms of prioritising what I think is important, um, there's, a, there's a few things. I think one is, um, and, and again, I'm not here to say that CAR T cells will be the magic, the magic bullet, the, the one silver answer either, um, because they won't. I think we need to be working in, con, in con collaboration. And I think that really um, the best treatments will be combination therapy, combination personalised therapies. So, you know, understanding more about the, the makeup, the genetic makeup, the proteomic makeup of the individual tumours is absolutely key because in order to do that, because of the delicate location of the brain, as opposed to different parts of the body, it means we need to be very sure that if we're targeting any, you know, the cancer with a, a drug or a T cell or whatever, um, that it's specific for the cancer and that there'll be no collateral damage of healthy brain tissue. So that's absolute key. So sort of understanding uh, more about the brain. And so that, again, as I said before, relies on having access to fresh tissue, which is really key. That allows us to do that work. 
and, and then finding, identifying more targets. So whether they're proteins express the cell surface that we can target with antibodies or T cells or drugs, or then the, you know, what the inner workings of the cell as well, the metabolomics, um, understanding the interplay between the tumor and its environment. As I said, brain tumors are considered to be very, what we call immunologically cold, which means they don't have a lot of um, um, sort of active, you know, inflammation and recruitment processes around them to get, you know, help, help really supercharge that immune system, which is really what we need. Um, the other thing, of course, is um, we haven't touched on yet is the, the blood brain barrier. There's, you know, that's the beauty of T cells as opposed to other drugs. And this is not just a, a size dependent thing. It doesn't mean that the smaller something is, the easier it is to get into the brain. There are very precise mechanisms in the blood brain barrier to keep things out and out of the brain, to keep our brain protected from things like infection. Um, and pathogens and such. And so what that means is then it can be really hard to design drugs to get across. So I think that's another big area um, of research. And I think underpinning all of this and sort of the foundation sitting over all of this is, is collaboration and this multidisciplinary approach. So it's people like, you know, it's, it's the, the lab scientists, the lab rats like us working with um, you know, oncologists like like Liz and, and Jim working closely with our neurosurgical colleagues, working closely with our um, our nursing teams and our supported care programs. Um, and of course, at the centre of this is patients and their families and listening to them and, and knowing that you know when we design therapies that we've taken all of you know all of that into account. So yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, Marina. But I think you know just one final thing is that we are this is still very cutting edge. You know, immunotherapies are very cutting edge. It's, it is it is new. There's only been five, you know, reported clinical trials on the planet so far for CAR Ts in brain cancer. But but watch this space. I think Australia has has uh, is punching above its weight. Mm, that's exciting. Okay, just a little bit more on oh, Liz. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add just very very quickly to what Misty has said, which is fantastic. That you know, um, I think on, on on a global stage as well. I think Australia generally or oncology in Australia has a fairly good um, global reputation and standpoint. And so um, Misty um, is really leading or blazing the, the future for um, the experimental immunology and that for patients in Australia. Um, and that's fantastic. It's really world, world standard, world-class research. On the other sort of end of the spectrum for clinical trials as well, um, the large um, you know, pharmaceutical trials um, do frequently come to Australia as well. Um, some sites within Australia, um, because Australia has a pretty good reputation internationally in trials as well. So I think that um, we are well placed in Australia. Um, we do tend to have a mixture of the early um, experimental approaches, but also um, the good standing means that we often do get involved in um, the large multinational efforts as well too. So I think we're fortunate here in that respect. Okay, another uh, question along the same lines. Uh, just uh, maybe Jim, just views on the dendritic T cell research. I know this has been around for some years. Look, and I'm going to probably pivot here to Misty, so be prepared. Um, look, I think, you know, there's been, there have been a lot of efforts to try and target the immune system in brain cancer of a variety of different approaches, including vaccine therapies, um, what we would broadly refer to as immunotherapy, which have been very successful in melanoma and lung cancer, but less so in brain cancer so far. Um, and there's numbers of different types. I think the, the framework of it, there's different types of immune cells, which all have sort of different functions in the brain. And, you know, ultimately when we're thinking about immunotherapy, it's about trying to use your body's immune system to recognize that cancer cell as the foreign body and to get rid of it. Um, and dendritic cells and dendritic cell vaccines is one of the ways that this has been sort of considered. There were some sort of early reports with some early trials, which suggested this might be a way to go, but Unfortunately, when they've been tested in larger randomised trials, that hasn't quite played out yet. Um, so I think what I would say is that I think similar to the concept that, that Misty raised, that I think treatment is going to require multiple agents, multiple approaches that might range from personalised medicine to immunotherapy, including CAR T cells. I think it's not going to be one thing which leads to improvements. It's likely going to be combination therapies. 
but in the field of dendritic cells and immune um, biology for brain tumors, um, I defer to Misty. No, that's right. That's actually really well summarized. Um, and I know we're sort of getting out of time, but um, it's, they haven't really worked really. And there's been a bunch of vaccine approaches, both, you know, using vac uh, dendritic cells and also other cell types sort of loaded up with, with what we call tumor antigen or parts of the parts of, you know, DNA that are specific for the tumor and not on healthy cells. And, um, and they just haven't worked. And again, it's that sort of approach of, you know, bumping up the immune system you already have, or taking a, car approach which is then just engineering it you know because if the patient doesn't have it themselves we can actually just engineer it and give it to them so uh, you know uh, uh, um there have been disappointing results in the dendritic cell um space um there are there are um uh, i should just mention as well again it's all this is all super new and cutting edge and not in trials at all yet but there are different you know cars going into different cell types for that purpose so to say okay well we can give a car to a T cell, chimeric antigen receptor, that engineered receptor I talked about, but we can also give it to, we can give it um, a, a negative receptor to a negative cell, which will mean that then we can sort of shut down and that negative immune response and let the positive immune response take hold. So sort of shutting down the immunosuppressive immune response. So we can put cars in different cell types which will then dictate the kind of immune response we have. And so it's sort of tailoring and engineering these personalised immune responses is, is really cutting edge, but it is the really the way of the future and it's where this field is headed. Great. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question, which kind of, um, to Misty, if that's okay, which kind of feeds off some of the questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A. People are saying things like, what about um, lower grade gliomas? Mm. So we're talking a lot about GBM. Misty, do you think that if these, I know that as a in wearing my clinical hat, things that work in GBM often will work in the sort of gliomas as well. I'm thinking of chemotherapy drugs like temozolomide. Do you think that there's hope that these um, developments in GBM will also be relevant for things like um, gliomas, like oligodendrogliomas and things like that? Absolutely. I think so. And I think, you know, the reason the field has started with the the, gl the glioblastomas or the, you know, the DIPGs in kids is just the high, you know, it's just the, the poor prognosis of those tumours. And I think became because it's new and cutting edge, we're targeting those groups that, that you know, that, um, that where therapies are more urgently required. The, the um, of course, that's not to say that they won't be rolled out. I think as time goes on, I can sort of, I could see, in, you know, in 10 years time, we will be treating, this will become standard practice this will become standard of care we're not there yet it's still experimental it's still very expensive that's the other downside it, these therapies are really expensive but as we start to again we've only got this one clean room here in melbourne getting them manufactured and is very expensive and so i think as as you get a bit of mass capacity um you know we can i could start to see that those costs will come down and, and there are also then other ways as well um to reduce that to the to that we can get them into standard of care in terms of the way they're manufactured, having more of an off the shelf product, um, you know, ready to go on the shelf, so you can say, okay, here's your tumor. This low grade glioma has proteins A, B, and C that we could target on it, and we have those CAR T cells made. Here we go. I, I mean, I think that's we're years away from we're probably a decade away from that, um, unfortunately. But I think we need to just get to the stage where we can show tumor regression and, and prolong life now in in these sort of really challenging tumors like gbm and then i think they'll be rolled out mm. just on that misty talked about it a bit there but can we explain why the trials are primarily been in glioblastoma as opposed to oligos or ganglioglioma or meningioma these other primary brain tumors so i think there's a number of reasons and um you know, I think the core one is that I think we need to recognise that for adult brain cancers, glioblastoma is still, you know, by far accounts for the most um, new cancers. And is um, although, you know, we're always hopeful of, you know, good outcomes and there are some patients who can have good outcomes, for the vast majority of patients, it is a devastating diagnosis and a significant impact on them and their families. And so that has been where a lot of the efforts have been focused. And I think you know, justifiably so, because it is such an important problem that we need to address. Um, and overall, 
brain cancer is still a rare cancer diagnosis. So when we start looking into smaller and smaller subtypes, unfortunately, some of the lower grade gliomas, oligodendroglioma and diffuse astrocytomas or rare cancers like ganglioglioma or neural cytoma has been mentioned in the chat. Sometimes we just don't have enough people with the same cancer type to do the right clinical trial and to answer the right questions. I think that's changing. I think there has been a significant focus on trying to understand rarer cancers and how they might um, better access funding for clinical trials, how we can develop consortiums across the country and internationally so that we can get enough people together to answer important questions. Because the last thing that we want to do is to do bad science, which doesn't answer, or a, a clinical trial, which doesn't answer an important question because, you know, we haven't done um, the right research and designed it appropriately. Mm. Did you want to add anything, Liz? No, look, I think that that's, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just to mention as well, so this um, session will end at 12.15. We'll be back at 1 o'clock for the afternoon session. Uh, you can use the same link that you linked into or, or at, connected to uh, to join this morning's session for the afternoon link. So just a reminder about that. And, again, the surveys um have been attached to the chat and will be sent out to you to your email address if you you're a um, participant as well so just before we wrap up we've got a couple of minutes but there's been a few questions around grading um obviously you know with the grade one to four system with primary brain uh, tumors can we someone talk a little bit around the grading system and how we grade tumors I can I can have a bit of a go at this one. It's um, this um, essentially grade the grade of the tumor is shorthand for us to talk about how aggressive the tumor cells look um, under the microscope. I, I sort of say so um, how how quickly they look like they would grow and how aggressive they're behaving. Um, and so it's often on a scale. So in brain tumors, it can be scale one to four and one would be the lowest grade. So the, the least sort of aggressive looking ones and four would be the highest grade. So that's the opposite there. Um, to, for, for us as, um, for myself and Jim, um, as oncologists, um, we rely a lot on our um, colleagues in pathology. So these are the specialist doctors who um, use microscopes and do certain tests in the lab um, to look at what does the cell actually look like under the microscope? What are its characteristics? Um, like, um, you know, how its size, the size of the nucleus, if there's lots of cells dividing that are visible within the tumour. But these days, increasingly, also the grade um, can be determined by additional tests as well. So by that, I mean these sorts of genomic um, mutations that they can test for either by doing genomic sequencing or by looking to see with little um, probes um, what sort of proteins um, are on the surface of the cell under the microscope. So all of those things together come in and tell us what the stage are, um, of, of the tumour is. Um, why is it important? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, it gives us a bit of an idea about what the behaviour of the tumour will be. So issues like prognosis um, really hinge upon this, uh, but also it can direct us as to how we should best treat the tumours. So take um, an oligodendroglioma or a, or a glioma, an astrocytoma um, versus a GBM. So these are different grades. And really from research that's been done already in the field, um, we know that we need to treat one in one way and one in a different way. So it's important from that perspective as well. Yeah. Okay. We might wrap it up there because it's 12.15. We, I think we can keep talking and talking with this and there's lots of great questions coming through, but we'll try to answer these this afternoon in, in the session that's starting at 1 o'clock this afternoon. I'd like to thank everybody, Misty, Liz, Jim for attending this morning's session. Great talks. I learn something every time. Um, thanks very much.
Hello, my name's Marina Castellan. I work as the neuro-oncology nurse practitioner at the Brain Cancer Group. If you are returning from this morning's session, uh, thank you for coming back. If you're just starting with us this afternoon, um, welcome. The Brain Cancer Group is proud to sponsor today's education forum, and we hope you all enjoy the day and are able to learn something new or just know that you're being supported through these groups, such as the Brain Cancer Group and Brain Tumor Alliance Australia. At the Brain Cancer Group, we are focused on improving patient outcomes across the spectrum. We do this by taking a multidisciplinary and collaborative approach aimed at improving the lives of those impacted by brain cancer. We achieve this by fulfilling three tiers, research, education and support. And we welcome you to the Brain Tumor Alliance Australia Patient Education and Information Forum. We've got another three excellent uh, speakers this afternoon. Um, we're hoping to go into a uh, Q&A session around 2.10 this afternoon and then wrapping things up around 3 o'clock this afternoon. So we'll begin this afternoon's session just before we start, just to remind you all that uh, we have a Q&A session going. So if you want to ask questions, we'll do our best at the end of the three sessions to answer your questions. Also, you will be uh, emailed a survey um, to, if you are a participant um, and you registered. There's also the link in the chat session as well, which we'll put up again shortly. I'm really pleased to uh, introduce the first speaker for this afternoon's session. I'm really looking forward to her talk. This is Maureen Daniels, who's the coordinator at the Jerry and Nancy Pencer Brain Tumor Centre in Toronto, Canada. Very pleased to have her here. Uh, she will talk about a bouquet of supportive care, 20 years of evolution learned and looking ahead. Thanks very much, Maureen. Thanks, Marina. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I just like to say thank you so much for the invitation. I was so excited and um, pleased to be able to share our Toronto experience with uh, everybody in Australia today. I, I would say uh, good afternoon, but for me here, it's good evening. And uh, I guess I'm talking to you from the past, not uh, uh, to you in the future. So um, I uh, am eager to, to share our experience with you. I'll um, give a little bit more of an explanation uh, about the title of my talk in just a few minutes, but um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, when, when I was asked to give this talk, um, uh, I was asked to really focus on supportive care. And so I thought I uh, perhaps would provide um, uh, a definition for supportive care that I think really sort of encompasses what we uh, have been striving to do um, in terms of our model of care at uh, the Pencer Center. And uh, this definition from the National Cancer Institute seemed to really um, uh, um, sum it up in a good way for me. So um, moving on from there, if I could have the next slide. I'd like to introduce you to Jerry Penser, who is the hero in our story. Um, Jerry was uh, a very successful Canadian businessman and um, the, the CEO of um, a private label soft drink company, Caught Beverages. Uh, he was a uh, very successful, uh, I think outside the box kind of guy. And we like to say he was a very effervescent man. But in 1997, at the age of 52, Jerry was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. And uh, he was extraordinary in many ways. Uh, the one way that he was completely ordinary was that he lived about a year with his glioblastoma. Um, but in that year, if I could have the next slide, he and his family um, uh, took on um, a task to transform the way patients are treated with uh, brain tumors in uh, Toronto specifically, but I think hopefully it's had a broader impact. Uh, Jerry was, um, as I said, a think outside the box kind of guy. And um, during 
the time uh, early on in his diagnosis, he and his family looked to um, educate themselves about his illness and to look for supports and resources and um, uh, discovered quite quickly that um, uh, the system was um, very fractured. Uh, it was hard to access some types of services and, um, um, and it was very piecemeal. So you had to go one place to get one type of support and someplace quite different for, for something else. And so um, if I could have the next slide, um, out of that sort of frustration was born uh, a really wonderful partnership. Uh, the Penser family made a sizable donation to uh, the Princess Margaret Hospital. And um, with uh, working in conjunction with the Jerry and Nancy Penser Brain Trust and the Princess Margaret, uh, we saw the establishment of the Jerry and Nancy Penser Brain Tumor Center, which um, has a goal to um, provide comprehensive care in um, uh, one location. And so um, I'm just going to quickly sort of uh, share with you some photographs of our, our place. We are very fortunate to have a lovely environment. And um, just to circle back to the title of my talk, um, uh, Mrs. Penser remains very involved in our center. And uh, uh, while things, a lot of things are paused by COVID, prior to COVID, she um, made sure that we have uh, about a half a dozen beautiful bouquets in our center of fresh flowers every week so that um, our space is really meant to try and ease anxiety for patients and families. And, um, um, make it a place where um, patients and families know they can come to um, seek professional support um, for education and also um, as a quiet respite in the middle of a very tumultuous time for them. So um, I recall very clearly when our center opened and um, there was a, it was a very innovative approach to um, uh, patient space in the hospital. And quickly people uh, started calling it the palace um, and the penthouse. We were on the top floor of the hospital as well. And um, my response to that was always, if you don't, if you shouldn't feel like you should have a nice place to sit when you've been newly diagnosed with a brain tumor, I don't know when you'd do deserve a nice place to sit. So um, our physical space is really meant to be um, as much a part of the supportive care model that we practice as the other things that I'm gonna talk to you about today. So if I could have the next slide. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a very large multidisciplinary team at our center. And this is um, a, a pretty good portion. It's not the whole team, but a pretty good portion. That picture was taken mm, maybe three years ago. Um, if I could have the next slide, this is what we look like today. Um, but we are still um, uh, very uh, collegial and uh, um, a dedicated group. And um, so we are working within the confines that COVID puts us in. Um, but uh, we are eager to get back to the looking like the first slide for sure. Uh, if I could have the next slide. Um, this is the, the sort of linchpin of our treatment model. This is our medical team. Um, we are very fortunate, I'm sure, um, for people who have joined us today, there's some names on the list who are familiar to um, people in the international brain tumor community. Dr. Mason is our medical director and our neuro-oncologist. And we have four amazing radiation oncologists who see our patients every week as well. Um, Dr. Norm LaPerriere, Dr. Barbara Ann Miller, Dr. David Schultz, and Dr. Derek Sang. Um, so we are very fortunate in the, the medical support that we have in our center. 
Um, if I could have the next slide, please. This is what our sort of weekly clinics look like. We have nine primary CNS clinics a week. We see approximately 125 primary brain tumor patients each week, all um, at various stages of, of treatment from newly diagnosed patients to patients who are at end of life. Um, and of that 125 patients, between 10 and 12 are people who are, we are seeing for the first time um, in a given week. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. This is sort of a, a brief overview of um, who our staff are, and I'm uh, really eager to share with you uh, the roles that these um, uh, uh, team members um, play and, and the individuals who fill those roles because there are some pretty remarkable people in that group. Um, and if I could have the next slide, one of the sort of hallmarks of our, um, our model is we do meet weekly as a team um, on Fridays each week. The purpose of our getting together is to review all of our patients, all of the new patients we've seen each week, and um, to um, update each other on other patients with um, acute or ongoing issues. And really the benefit of this is that it puts us all on the same page about how our patients are doing and um, the other um, ripple benefit of all of that is that we certainly learn a lot from each other each week. Um, everybody shares their expertise and, uh, um, and that's great. And, and it's really just nice for all of us to be together in the same room. It really fosters wonderful collegiality. And um, so that's uh, a big bonus. Um, next slide, please. We are also, um, as Dr. Ko mentioned, uh, a teaching center, and we certainly benefit greatly from uh, the dynamic energy of our medical trainees, um, medical students, residents, fellows, and also uh, a variety of students from all of the allied health disciplines, many of the people on our team um, are regularly mentoring other um, uh, trainees in their area of expertise. And so we're very fortunate to have um, all of that youthful energy and knowledge to add to our um, center as well. So I'd like to just tell you now a little bit about some of the people who do the work that um, that we do every week and, and really how they fit into our model of supportive care. We um, have a wonderful admin administrative assistant, uh, Sonia Silva, who is really the glue who keeps our center um, moving. Sonia is familiar with um, many, many of the patients and they with her and they certainly know who to call if they need to get action. And uh, she is a master at streamlining tests and appointments for our patients. And she also really keeps the administrative side of our practice running very smoothly and efficiently. Next slide, please. Cheryl Cantor is our social worker and she has been our social worker um, for the last 20 years. And um, the social work position in our center is really an excellent sort of example of our um, private public partnership. Um, prior to the opening of our center, our CNS site was allocated a half time social workers. So, um, so that meant somebody was available to our patients sort of half time. And um, with the, in collaboration with um, the added resources um, provided by the Penser family, um, that social work position was um, expanded to be a full-time position. So now we have a full-time social worker, Cheryl, who works in our site. She has a great deal of expertise in patient and family counseling and is very uh, able to see patients in a timely way. Um, she uh, also has a wealth of knowledge about um, financial supports and um, guidance about how to access those kinds of things. And she's a very uh, one of the very experienced facilitators of our caregiver support group. So we're very fortunate to, to not only have a, this full-time position, but also to have such a um, 
capable person in that role. Next slide, please. We are also very fortunate to have the full-time resources of Dr. Kim Edelstein, who is our neuropsychologist. Kim's role is really um, uh, two-pronged. She has a very active clinical um, portion of her practice where she will see our patients for um, comprehensive neurocognitive assessments, particularly patients who are contemplating returning to work or school. Um, sometimes family members are, are eager to have uh, a neuropsych assessment for patients. Um, so Kim uh, provides that service to our patients at no cost to them. Um, and she also has a very dynamic research component to her role, um, studying a variety of strategies for improving, um, coping with neurocognitive impairments, um, and also looking at ways to improve quality of life for our patients. Um, she also is able to provide a lot of expertise, um, both to other members of our care team and to, to people in the community. Um, oftentimes a full blown neuropsycholo neuropsychological assessment is um, uh, difficult to um, undertake for some patients. And um, Kim's just uh, also very available to provide expertise on uh, how to help patients cope in um, the situation where a neuropsych exam is not always the best option. Um, Kim also is a very experienced um, a facilitator of our caregiver support group. So we're um, fortunate to have that expertise um, as well. Next slide. Um, we also have the very unique position, and I'm going to come back and talk about this position a little bit more shortly, but we have a rehabilitation consultant um, on our team. This is Kristen Collins. Kristen is an occupational therapist by training, and she is on our team to provide assessment of functional status for patients, um, provide assistance about assistive aids, um, provide education for things like energy conservation, fatigue management, and also a very um, capable facilitator for a caregiver group. She also runs um, a weekly relaxation therapy program for our patients and family members. Um, this um, uh, role has also been really instrumental in helping us to develop a lot of educational materials for patients and caregivers. And um, one of the really beneficial uh, things about this role as well is that it provides a great resource for um, rehabilitation um, supports in the community. Many of our patients get referred for um, rehabilitation support such as OT or physio in the community. Um, and they are seen by people who um, don't have a lot of experience in um, treating patients with, with brain tumors. So Kristen is available to um, liaise with those people in the community to provide additional um, uh, uh, education and support to, to help manage that. Um, and um, of course, I'm a nurse by background myself, so I uh, want to certainly acknowledge the contribution of our clinic nurses who are really the boots on the ground in our clinics, and um, they provide um, hands-on education. Um, Mary Jane and Dolores in this picture have many years of experience in uh, um, helping patients manage their chemotherapy and um, symptoms and side effects associated with both their disease and their treatment and are also an excellent resource for um, helping to connect people with community supports. Um, next slide. We also have uh, not solely allocated to our center, but certainly within Princess Margaret, um, a very big outpatient pharmacy and our pharmacists are really uh, expert at helping to um, uh, dispense medications to our patients uh, with additional education and also um, things as simple as um, dispensing the medications in ways that makes it easy to understand and, and for patients to um, be able to take their medication 
properly. Um, and of course, they also provide a lot of education just around general medication questions and drug interactions. Um, next slide, please. They also have a dietitian. I don't have a photograph because uh, our dietitian who was with our team for the last 20 plus years just retired and we have uh, a new dietitian who's joined us. But of course, for many of our patients, there are a lot of nutritional concerns specific to their treatment. Certainly um, patients who are on chemotherapy have a lot of concerns about their nutrition. Um, any patients who are taking dexamethasone for any period of time often have nutritional questions and challenges. And so our dietitian has a lot of experience with helping people manage those kinds of questions. And, and again, once again, to provide general information about um, um, uh, proper diets, um, uh, cancer diets, and also general nutrition questions. Um, next slide. We also have a very um, vibrant clinical trials department and um, have typically have a number of clinical trials um, going on. And uh, our two clinical trials coordinators, Stephanie and Anyi, are really um, the linchpin there, um, responsible for enrolling patients and the ongoing monitoring of patients on any study. And really, they become the main point of contact for patients who are um, enrolled in studies. Um, there's a lot of meticulous work that goes along with being involved in a, a clinical trial, and they're really um, an amazingly knowledgeable resource um, and, and um, guides for uh, patients who are um, willing to be part of a trial. Next slide. Um, I, I really want to highlight our radiation therapists because in my view, uh, in many ways, they're sort of the unsung heroes of uh, patients who are just embarking on brain tumor treatment. Um, the radiation therapists are the people who really deliver the treatment every day to patients, particularly our glioblastoma patients who are, you know, most of the time starting on um, a, a very intensive uh, um, period of radiation therapy. And um, the radiation therapists are the people who see those patients on a daily basis for uh, six weeks at a time. So um, they have a great deal of expertise and um, um, education to help patients through this very tumultuous period of their treatment and um, are also excellent uh, resources for referring patients to other supportive care services as required. So um, we're fortunate that we have a really dedicated dynamic group of therapists at our center as well. Beyond that, um, over, the, over the last 20 odd years, we have um, tried to develop a supportive care program that um, uh, provides, um, provides services that are helpful and in some ways unique to our patient population. Certainly um, pre-COVID, and I'm going to come back to COVID again too, but uh, we um, offered monthly in-person support groups for both our patients and caregivers. Groups run separately, but at the same time um, in our center, we um, have offered weekly relaxation therapy for patients, um, art therapy programs. We do a celebration of life for patients um, who have passed. And over the years, we've run a number of uh, workshops specifically to try and address the needs of our caregivers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think one of the really beneficial um, aspects of our, our model is that for the most part, we are all housed in the same location. And that has really fostered a lot of collaboration for projects that would otherwise have been uh, very difficult. So over the years, we have um, developed a number of resources for patients, and this is sort of a, a partial list um, that you see in front of you, but certainly 
um, the um, opportunity to be in close proximity with uh, colleagues on a regular basis has really fostered a lot of um, beneficial um, um, educational and informational initiatives. Um, next slide. Uh, I also really want to um, sing the praises of our patient and family advisory committee. And once again, that's us on the left a couple years ago. That's us on the right a couple months ago. So um, this is a group of patients that when I think of them, next slide, please. Um, this is the, the, the thought that always comes into my mind. Um, our patient and family advisory committee is a group of patients and families uh, volunteers, uh, along with some clinic staff. Um, next slide, please. Who came together as a group um, at at um, uh, at Jerry Penser's sort of guidance to um, bring together patients and families to have significant input into both the design of. Uh, the Panzer Center, not just the physical design, but also to the programs and materials we provide. Um, and so uh, since June of 1998, we meet every month. And um, it's a way for us at the Panzer Center to um, have a patient voice to help guide what we do. Um, they're very good at telling us what we do well, and they're even better at telling us what we can do better. So um, it's a very valuable resource to us. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, I think one of the most proud accomplishments of our center of our patient and family advisory committee is um, about 10 years ago, they uh, thought that they would like to establish um, um, a research grant award. And um, we've named it the Adam Cools Research Grant. Adam was a member of our patient and family advisory committee for many years. Um, a young man who uh, passed far too soon. Um, and so we are very proud to offer this grant in his name annually. And in the last 10 years, our um, patient and family advisory committee have awarded almost three quarters of a million dollars in uh, research funding to brain tumor specific uh, projects within um, university health networks. So I think that's probably one of the most proud accomplishments of um, the group. Next slide, please. Just another minute, Maureen. Okay, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna um, finish up quickly. Then um, I will um, tell you that um, they have um, provided us with a lot of other beneficial um, uh, incentives as well. Next slide. I'm just gonna pop through, and um, they also provide a hundred percent of the support for our rehabilitation consultant. This position would not exist at all within our center if they were not there. Um, I'm just gonna get you to forward Dennis through a um, number of slides. They, um, the answer to how we provide that support is they do an annual fundraising run uh, and uh, we're closing in on $3 million raised in the last 20 years. I will get you to forward um, uh, through the next couple of slides, Dennis, and I'll finish up just very quickly, Marina. Um, we have um, in the past, a number of years, a number of years ago, did a um, an evaluation survey of our services, and um, I'll get you to uh, advance the slide again, Dennis. I won't go through all of the um, details, but essentially, the key findings of the study was that. Um, patients feel that the programs we offered have allowed them to take a more active role in their health care and help them to make more educated decisions, um, which was really great. Um, we were very gratified to hear that. But um, uh, I'll get you to forward, fast forward through a little further, Dennis. Um, 
But I think that um, I'll get you to stop there for a minute. We are in the, uh, as the pandemic hit, we were in a place where we were starting to look at refreshing our patient input. And um, so um, COVID has certainly impacted how we provide our care. Um, I'll get you to just um, go to the next slide, please, Dennis. And next. Um, and so COVID has certainly um, swung the pendulum um, in a different direction from when we first opened our center. And um, I think that um, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, this analogy sort of really struck me when I was thinking about how we go forward from here. Um, um, <laughs> our, um, many things have changed with COVID. And so as hopefully we see COVID um, behind us, I think that um, we can go to the next slide. Um, what we will um, endeavor to do going forward is to get some updated post-COVID patient and caregiver input. Um, we probably need to do a new survey of what supportive care services will look like and what they will would be beneficial, um, how patients, um, how we can address best patients need for support and care in a way that's easily accessible to them. Um, I, I guess I probably should just speak for myself, but I know um, virtual care has become a real pillar of COVID um, uh, necessity, but as a healthcare provider myself, I know I didn't become a healthcare provider so that I could spend all my time um, talking to patients on a computer. Um, I think there is real value in in-person um, care and relationships. And so I'm actually looking forward to hearing Professor Drummond's talk on online support and hearing how we can um, make that part of um, a valuable um, patient support going forward. Next slide, please, Dennis. So I'll, I'll finish there. I think I've probably taken more time than I was allotted, Marina, but thank you for indulging me. And um, I'm very grateful for the chance to um, share our center with you today. Thanks very much. I, I think that your um, talk just really highlights the need for a multidisciplinary approach. It's really important with this patient group. So our next speaker is Professor Kate Drummond. Uh, Dr Drummond's the Director of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And Kate will speak to us this afternoon, uh, online supportive care. Thanks, Kate. So can everyone see my slides and yes. hear me talking? Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so look, I mean, what a wonderful uh, um, example we've just seen of supportive care in place uh, and, and very um, associated with place. Um, we know that the pandemic has changed that a little bit, but also both for Canada and for Australia, big, com big countries, relatively small populations uh, and uh, patients who may be limited in their ability to drive, to travel, um, uh, may be a long way away from, uh, from, from a brain tumour centre. Um, and so we've really uh, been thinking about how we can um, augment or even replace in-person supportive care um, with a, a, a technology solution. Um, and this is, this is sort of the description of the $2.6 million MRFS grant that we've just received to develop this um, this platform, and you can see our partners um, our partners there. So it comes on the back of ten years, really, of uh, of research in quality of life for me. Um, so we've published uh, on multiple tumor types that um, patients with brain tumors have uh, reduced quality of life compared to a normal population and that this is persistent, that it persists for months to years after diagnosis if the patient is alive for months to years after diagnosis. Um, so this is just you know, a very simple graph of our results from our low-grade glioma patient. 
Um, it's the score on a quality of life survey it's called the QLQC30, a, a cancer quality of life survey. The light blue are the scores that you would expect from a normal population. So even a normal population doesn't have perfect health-related quality of life. Um, they've all got a cold or a hangnail or a headache or something that's reducing their quality of life. But our low-grade glioma patient has reduced scores on health-related quality of life, particularly related to role function, their ability to function in their normal social roles, emotional function, cognitive function, social function, a little less, interestingly, in physical function and in overall global health-related quality of life. And um, this is, uh, you know, from 576 uh, questionnaires from, you know, a large number of patients. And we know if we map these over time, so another bunch of complicated graphs, but basically this is the same, the score on the QLQC30. The orange is the line that you would expect the score for the normal population. The blue is the score from our low-grade glioma patient, a patient cohort. And the gray is what we call the minimally clinically important difference. The, the, the reduction in quality of life from normal that the patient would actually notice and find to be, to be real. Because a drop of the score from 99 to 98 is not significant, but from 99 to 89 is significant. And you can see that for global quality of life, for emotional function, particularly for cognitive function, the feeling that the brain, your brain is not working, social function and for symptoms like fatigue or sleep, there is a prolonged and significant abnormality in our brain, our low grade glioma patients. But these are things we often don't talk about. Who, who goes to their brain tumor clinic and someone talks to them about fatigue or are you sleeping well, for instance, or how do you think your brain's functioning? We, you know, neurosurgeons, we're pretty awful. It's pretty blunt instruments. Can you walk? Can you talk? So, you know, these things are things that we need to pay attention to. And it's not just the primary uh, intrinsic or, or tumours within the brain that have this, this problem. But even small meningiomas, patients often feel that their quality of life is reduced. And we've published on this as well. Um, and the, here's the same graph for meningioma, quality of life, physical function, role function, emotional function. Cognitive function, interesting for a tumour that's not even in the brain, is on the surface of the brain and social function reduced and reduced over time. So the same graph, the grey is the normal population, the, the, the dotted line is the clinically meaningful difference, the amount that you have to drop to notice it. Um, and we see that quality of life over time, over up to 120 months, emotional function, Cognitive function in particular, even right out at 120 months, patients scoring themselves 60 out of 100. Social function, fatigue, significantly poor, poor fatigue and significantly poor sleep. So we know there's a problem and we've proven this with our research. So this is a picture of Heidi McAlpine, one of my trainees and now a PhD student. She'll be a neurosurgeon um, and have a PhD in, uh, in, in, in glioma's as they uh, grow within the electrical uh, environment of the brain. Also was interested in improving um, quality of life or uh, supportive care and that we might be able to do this online because, you know, we were kind of failing uh, in person for, for a number of reasons. Uh, so we started uh, a, a three-phase project that she's really driven. Um, and we started this with, um, with a literature review, then our, uh, surveying our own patients, and then the, the grant really to develop the online community. So our literature review, which we've published, um, you know, we systematic, we, we looked at online interventions for supportive care. We couldn't have do review brain tumour because there weren't really any articles, but for cancer patients in general. And this wasn't just, we built a website and we asked people if they liked it and they said yes. This was, we built something online and we tested it and to see if it worked before and after or a control group or something that told us that it actually made a difference to patients. Um, we looked through the literature and we came up with, you know, one for four one articles. Um, we came down to 56 that we assessed because we thought they might be eligible. And in the end, we found 14 studies, only 14 studies where someone had built an online intervention and they'd proven um, that what, what effect or they'd rigorously assessed what effect it had. And what did we find out? Well, it was pretty disappointing, actually. We found out that a small number of patients, a um, small number of interventions actually made a difference. 
many made no difference at all. And worse still, some actually made patients feel worse. So we thought, okay, we probably need to think about this a little bit more clearly. Um, so um, we did exactly the same as the quality of life research that we've done, which it was been performed by an army of medical students going out into our brain tumor waiting clinic waiting room with a clipboard and, and assessing everyone's quality of life after they gave us their consent. We did exactly the same looking at how our patients use social media or online platforms for um, specifically for management or, or in connection related to their brain tumor. So, you know, not just people who use Facebook to catch up with friends, but people who use it specifically for their, their brain tumor. And we've obviously just published this as well. So we surveyed 200 patients. Well, what did we find out? We actually found out some really interesting things, which, which really crystallized for us that we need something online. You know, 34% of our patients live more than 50 kilometers from the hospital. That's a long, that's a long way to come for a support, some sort of supportive care, you know, a support group or, or, or you know, some sort of a, 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 um, a, a, a course or, or whatever. 46% didn't drive. 36% were not partnered in any way. Uh, so socially isolated and 71% not working. So socially isolated, geographically isolated um, and, you know, very difficult to, uh, to obviously... Um, to, to access services related to supportive care that were really place-based. And this was something we'd learnt when we tried to run support groups where, you know, many patients couldn't make it to the group for, for a, a variety of reasons and therefore missed out. So that encouraged us. Um, we found, uh, though, that, of course, there are a lot of patients uh, we had, you know, 14% of patients didn't use the internet at all. And of patients who um, were internet users, only 71% of those were social media users. Um, and on the non-social media users, why did they not use them? Well, really, lack of knowledge or, was one part, but 70% were scared that their information wouldn't be private. So that really taught us about you know, how we had to build this. Um, and people didn't use it super often, um, but 20% of people daily, many monthly, some less than monthly. So a bit of a mixed bag that, a, that an online intervention would target some patients, but perhaps not others. And you might think that perhaps the younger and more tech savvy, um, although a lot of uh, older patients, uh, of course, have the time to become very tech savvy. So what did we learn from this? Uh, you know, there's a lot more data in this study, but what, what did we learn that patients wanted for an online intervention for brain tumor patients? Well, they wanted the ability to control the amount and type of information that others knew about them makes sense. They wanted to use it at any time and location. That's obvious. They wanted to use it as a guide or a filter for useful information. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there, um, you know, on the internet um, and in, in, in forums and chat rooms and patient forums and Facebook. And uh, it's really hard to filter what's useful information. So they really wanted something that would help them filter useful information. They really valued if there was a health professional either moderating or contributing um, and they, they, they really wanted the ability to share experiences, especially access the experiences of others, um, which is a bit of an imbalance there. They wanted others' experiences, but not necessarily to share their own, but they particularly liked the blog format. Uh, so these were very useful. Um, and all of this research really um, crystallised in our, our application to, to build our online platform. And the online platform, it, it's got three pillars on one side and three pillars on the other side. So on one side, the pillars are patients, carers, and, 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 and clinicians of, of all varieties, um, you know, of, 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 of all varieties, not just, not just doctors, um, but allied health um, and, and other clinicians. And the three pillars of our solution would be connection with the treating team. Um, you know, patients we know have a lot of trouble um, finding the person they need to talk to. And I'm sure that's the administrative assistant that we've just heard of, but enhanced connectivity with the cancer nurse. And the ability to say access um, a Friday afternoon chat group with your, with your cancer nurse your, or your brain tumour nurse. Um, and an ability um, to um, access multidisciplinary care from diagnosis to end of life. The ability to have peer support. And we really saw that as almost targeted peer support um, you know, we've all been in brain tumour groups when perhaps 
um, the high grade glioma patients and the low grade glioma patients really don't fit together in the same group. Um, younger patients, uh, a young a young mother with a family might find um, fitting into a group which um, is old, uh, a, a bunch of uh, older patients facing different challenges is not, you know, not what will be really helpful. So the idea that we could have this eventually go national and have peer group supported for rural patients, for young patients, for different tumour types, for rare tumours, for adolescent and young adult patients um, was really an important challenge. And the second one was symptom management. This was key. Are we able to deliver treatment for determinants of quality of life on our platform? And what we've chosen to concentrate on in the prototype is sleep. So a cognitive behavioural therapy intervention to manage sleep disturbance. But of course, if this works and if we are able to deliver meaningful intervention, then this will, this will mean that we can grow this into the future. Um, of course, we've been uh, really um, uh, informed by, you know, definitions and understandings of the unmet need in supportive care, which we've defined as the prevention and management of the adverse effects of cancer and its treatment. Um, this slide is from Mike Krishnaswamy, um, Chair of Cancer Nursing at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, who is one of our, uh, one of our, the CIs on our grant. And, you know, her definition of supportive care and the unmet need really, um, melds very nicely with what we intend on do, doing. So supportive care screening, um, rehab or symptom intervention, um, families and carers are both able to um, access um, supportive groups. And I didn't mention that, but that would be, of course, one of the important support groups that we would be able to um, apply um, and, and be able to have psychology, rehabilitation, et cetera, um, in our platform. Um, so how are we going to build it? Well, there's a couple of fairly complicated um, slides here, but basically the basic principles are we have a digital platform um, provider, two balls, who've made many health award-winning healthcare um, associated digital platforms. Um, we, we partner with the Centre for um, the trans Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne. Um, and and the, the basic tenet is co-design. So at every aspect of design of this platform, it will be co-designed with patients, carers, and the clinicians who will use it. And so we've got a one-year uh, prototype development phase, um, which we're in the middle of at the moment. Um, two balls have done a number of sort of basic, what would you want with the tech um, uh, interviews with patients and carers and clinicians. Um, the, the Centre for the Digital Transformation of Health is now doing some deep um, interviews um, for the co-design process with patients, carers and clinicians. And then there'll be these living labs um, where we really test what we've found out. Um, and then we'll have a two year uh, intervention delivery and, um, and, and um, evaluation and implementation phase, um, which again, you can see here, a need analysis, um, really this, this co-design um, uh, iterative process with an iterative platform, which we will then implement and evaluate to transform the standard of care. And of course, we're doing this in Victoria, but we would love it to become national. Um, and this is new knowledge. You know, for drug development, I'm sure you've heard this morning from, uh, from say, Jim Whittle, who's also one of our collaborators. Um, you know, we have to discover and develop the drug. We do preclinical testing in animals and safety, and then there's phase one, two, three, phase four. It gets regulated and, and, and approved by the government, and it goes into the, into the community. For digital health innovations, we've got discovery and development, and then we've got this box, black box. Well, I've got a grey box here. I should probably change it to, to, to black box. As to how do we evaluate that it's going to work and it's going to help our patients? And we do hope that our research will fill in the grey box um, to help uh, our better understanding of implementing and evaluating digital health um, innovations. Um, so that's, you know, really all I want to talk about. And I think that we'll be uh, having some questions later. So um, uh, we will be uh, later in, um, you know, in a sort of a year down the track, which is about seven months down the track now for the project. We'll be looking for uh, 200 people as part of the iterative um, feedback and development process. So hopefully uh, some of you who are, who are listening there um, may be able to be involved in that process and uh, and we would certainly welcome you. 
Thanks very much, Kate. You know, from a care coordination point of view, I think this is a fantastic initiative. A lot of patients, you know, don't have care coordinators or a support person, depending on what area they're in. Um, and as you mentioned there, you know, if you're in a big metropolitan centre, you may come to a big city hospital for surgery and then return to your rural or regional area where you might be the only person there with the brain tumour. So, um, you know, online support, things like this are, are fantastic. So very much looking forward to that. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Charles Malpas. Um, Dr. Malpas is a neuropsychologist at Royal Melbourne Hospital, uh, and he will speak to us this afternoon on caring for your brain. Thanks very much, Charles. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for the opportunity to talk. Can everyone hear me all right and you can see my... Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, so, yes, I'm a neuropsychologist, and I thought I'd talk about caring for your brain, but mostly from a neurocognitive perspective or, or how to think about improving cognitive function. Um, this is, of course, the area that I know quite well, but I'm going to talk uh, mainly about the sorts of things that I have in discussion with patients who ask me questions about these sorts of things and what they can do to improve cognitive function. Um, I've got a little picture up there um, of a phrenology brain. I'm sure many of you are aware that... Um, many years ago, hopefully, people thought that um, different parts of the brain would grow uh, according to certain personality characteristics, and this would leave particular bumps on the skull, and a phrenologist could come along and feel your skull and tell you uh, whether or not you're a reflective person, or perhaps you're a very benevolent person or something. And of course, this is absolute pseudoscience. Uh, what's it doing here? Well, unfortunately, we still have to deal with these sorts of problems, as in uh, people often on the internet, but not always, who are very willing to try to offer advice, usually with a fee um, and usually with the promise of some kind of miraculous cure for cognition. Uh, but really, um, they don't often do very much at all except take our money. And so whenever we're talking about things to improve cognition, uh, things to deal with cognitive impairment, we have to be very, very careful about the information that we're getting um, especially on the internet. I'm sure that's not news to anybody, but it's always worth pointing out. And I'll talk a bit about that um, with a particular example later on. Um, so I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training and I work mainly at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, I run a number of clinics there. Um, and, and some of you may have encountered neuropsychologists, but some not. Um, we're a bit of a rare breed sometimes. Um, so neuropsychologists are specialists in the diagnosis and management of cognitive disorders. And so whenever there's a question of whether or not a patient has a cognitive disorder and its severity and its characteristics, the neuropsychologist is usually the best person to go to see um, if you can find one. The kind of specific questions that we get from other clinicians are things like, does the patient have a cognitive impairment? Uh, this often seems like a, a bit of a strange one. You would think that most people know if they have a cognitive impairment or if they do have a cognitive impairment or they feel they have one, that they actually do uh, in their brain. Actually, it's not that simple, unfortunately. Sometimes people can think they have an impairment and really believe that, but actually be quite normal for various reasons we can discuss later. And sometimes people cannot be aware that they have a cognitive impairment as well. So seeing a neuropsychologist for clear diagnosis can be very important. In particular, it's important to understand the specific kind of cognitive impairment uh, that might be going along with the brain tumour. Cognition is not one thing. We have different cognitive functions, uh, memory, language, and so on. And understanding what's working well and understanding what isn't working so well can help in particular with rehabilitation and compensatory strategies. So it really does need to be, in terms of cognition, an individual approach with the individual patient. There are no shortcuts to that. Sometimes the question is whether or not the cognitive impairment, if there is one, is consistent with the known brain tumour or is it suggestive of something else? And this particularly happens in patients who are older or have other risk factors for things like dementia. And sometimes someone might have had a brain tumour years ago and been doing quite well, but perceived perhaps over recent months that things are getting worse in memory or language or something of that nature. And one of the questions we can help answer is, is this to do with the brain tumour? Or is it that there might be something else going on that could warrant treatment? 
very commonly the question of psychiatric disorder or mental health issues arises. And of course, uh, having a neurological or neurosurgical condition doesn't immunize you against having psychiatric issues as well and mental health problems. And in fact, often they go together. And one of the questions we get very often is, is there a psychiatric disorder that is on the top of this? Is it contributing in some way or is it causing cognitive dysfunction? And uh, most importantly, of course, what management or treatment is best for this patient from a cognitive perspective and cognitive rehabilitation and the kind of rehabilitation that might be appropriate is of course one question but also what other treatments or management strategies might be important should this person go and see a clinical psychologist or a sleep physician or a pain physician for example to help with their cognition and sometimes the question is can this patient make decisions by themselves sometimes unfortunately cognitive impairment can cause some difficulties with decision-making. And we have an important role in protecting patients' rights to help them make their own decision if they can, or to find the best way forward for them to make those decisions. Um, our clinic, um, like many clinics in a public hospital, uh, we have a, a consultant neuropsychologist, which is me, meant to be running the whole thing, trying to keep it going. But we also have another um, number of other clinicians, neuropsychology fellows, so neuropsychologists in their uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth year of training, will be working in our clinic. And if you come into a clinic, that's probably the first person you'll see. We also have a neuropsychiatry fellow in some of our clinics now, the Royal Melbourne, just really emphasizing that overlap between cognitive symptoms and mental health or psychiatric symptoms. And of course, neuropsychology in turn. So trainees at earlier stages of their pathway to becoming a neuropsychologist. When we talk about cognitive impairment, we're talking about a lot of different things. Uh, and it will be different for every patient. And of course, some patients might not have any at all. But we're talking about difficulty with speech and language. So difficulty speaking, understanding, reading and writing. Difficulty sometimes with visuospatial functions. So seeing things, processing visual information, driving and navigating through the world. Very common with some patients have difficulty with that. Finding things in space. The executive functions, which it would be a topic all of its own, but things such as planning behavior for the future, organizing things, getting motivated, and social cognition, so engaging in social situations with others. And of course, problems with memory, which is probably the main reason people come to see us because they're worried that they're losing the ability to remember things, encode new information, recall it later on. And as I said before, um, whether or not a patient has one of these things or, or multiple or different is unique virtually for every patient and, and requires a unique level um, approach. What causes cognitive impairment? Well, the main thing really is the location of the tumor. That's gonna be the, probably the most proximal factor that determines what kind, if any, of cognitive impairment the patient might have. And there are some general rules to this, but there are only general rules really. So I've uh, just put a bit of a, a cartoon of a brain there, but if you have some sort of abnormality in the parietal lobe, you might have problems with language, with reading or writing, or with some aspects of attention. For patients with tumors in the frontal lobes, it can be quite complex, but this is typically where you would see impairments in executive function. So planning, motivation, apathy, and so on. Uh, in the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, quite often associated with vision impairments or visual perceptual, uh, perception impairments. And within the temporal lobes, uh, very often language and some aspects of attention, but also memory. So these are sorts of general rules that we use, but again, really it has to be a patient specific approach because you could have two patients who have exactly the same tumor location, it looks identical, one will have a memory problem and one won't notice any memory problems at all. So this kind of variability is actually quite normal. The size of the tumor will have a big effect as well on cognition and also the kinds of treatment that have been performed. So surgical treatments, radiotherapy and chemotherapy and other treatments all have different effects and can in their own right cause cognitive impairment too. So I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but really every patient needs to be treated individually to understand if there is any cognitive impairment and what kind of cognitive impairment uh, there is.
what can we do about these? And I think it's important here to think about impairments being primary, that is related to the tumour itself, or secondary, which is related to other things. I'm going to talk about uh, secondary impairments a lot in just a moment because they're the ones that are uh, often a bit easier to do something about. So um, what can we do about primary impairments? Well, of course, the first thing is treatment. And uh, the, the treatment itself, the kind of treatment, will often determine whether primary impairments improve or change over time. As a neuropsychologist, that's not really um, what we're involved with, but it's an important factor to take into account. The most important thing when we see patients, especially in the early days, and especially after something like surgery, is we say, wait. Quite often, especially after surgery or radiotherapy, cognitive impairment can be worse, but it can recover over time and sometimes quite quickly. So trying to be patient as much as possible is very important. Allow the brain time to recover and to heal. So quite often, if a patient comes to us, say, in the first you know, weeks or months following some kind of intervention, we'll often won't examine their cognition at that point because that really doesn't serve much purpose. It can be distressing in its own right. And we know that quite possibly in the next couple of months, things would look very different. So waiting, giving treatment time to work. Very often we see patients who are contemplating going back to work um, and or to some sort of function or some sort of occupation. One of the most important things we think is doing that gradually. It's very normal to want to go back and to engage in cognitive tasks such as complex work, care responsibilities and so on very, very quickly. But that has to be done in what we say a graded manner. So gradually over time, and that could be weeks to months. So you might go back to work perhaps half a day at a time or for a few hours at a time, allowing yourself time to rest and recover. That's important because if there is any residual cognitive impairment, you need time to get used to that and to work out ways of dealing with it. But one of the things that we're very aware of is what we call adjustment disorders or neurocognitive adjustment disorders. And this often happens when people uh, have some sort of treatment, they want to go right back to work straight away. They think they're going to be able to do very, very well, but then they get to work and they realize they're actually not up to it cognitively. And then they form the view in their mind that they're broken and that they'll be like this forever. And that is a, a big concern because it's very hard sometimes to shift that belief once it forms. Whereas if a patient goes back to work slowly and gradually over time, quite often we can avoid that, allowing yourself to build up very slowly to it. So gradual return to work is very, very important. And when we say to patients about return to work, if you're feeling frustrated because it's not happening quick enough, that's probably about the right speed. If you're not feeling frustrated, you're probably going back a little bit too fast and you've got to be careful with that. Cognitive strategies can be very useful to help with primary cognitive impairments. And the specific strategies that might help will depend on the specific kinds of impairment. So quite often we see patients who come in and they tell us that they're very worried about their memory, they're unable to remember, say, conversations or things they've read. When we examine them, we find that their memory is actually quite normal, but their attention isn't functioning very well. So our attentional system is what allows us to filter out information in the world and focus on what we need to. And so if the attentional system isn't working very well, there's no way the memory system can work well because the information never gets in. And so the strategies in that situation would be to reduce attentional demands on cognition. So things like ensuring you're working in a quiet environment, ensuring you're working at one thing at a time, working in chunks of time for 15 minutes and so on. And these, of course, are very general ideas, but the idea is that you um, cater for the individual, yet they're tailored to the specific individual. Sometimes modifying the environment is necessary to help with primary cognitive impairment. So these will be things such as using alarms, calendars, and other devices quite often uh, to help compensate for cognitive impairment. And sometimes that will be very... Um, a big change for the individual is something like having a large calendar on the wall with all the upcoming appointments, things like that. Sometimes smaller things. So in people who go back to work, the biggest advice we always give about modifying the environment is if you've got two screens on your desk and you've been working a lot using that method, you have one screen from now on and you have one thing that you're doing at a time. It can make a huge difference um, 
uh, to cognitive function. The biggest, well, I suppose another very important one is the idea of self-compassion. Sometimes when we see patients in, in clinic, um, the, the patient will be very frustrated with their cognitive function. And that's natural, of course. But, and they really will be kicking themselves when they can't remember a word or they can't get a sentence out or something. And, and that's absolutely understandable. The problem with that is that when you get frustrated and you want to kick yourself, that actually makes the cognitive dysfunction worse quite often. And so you have to have a bit of self-compassion. You've got to stop kicking yourself. And quite often we point out to patients that they're treating themselves much more harshly than they would treat somebody else that they cared for in the same situation. Always very easy for me to say to somebody, um, I'm not that naive, but it's something to keep in mind um, that self-compassion can go a long way into actually improving cognitive function. There were the sort of primary causes of cognitive dysfunction, but there are a lot of secondary causes that are very, very important. Most of these are common sense and we know these are good things to sort of avoid anyway, but poor sleep affects our cognition no matter who you are, but it particularly affects your cognition if you've had something like a brain tumor. It has huge effects. And one night of poor sleep can be the equivalent of getting up and getting into your car after having one beer. It really is that significant. And people who have chronically poor or disrupted sleep will have chronically poor and disrupted cognitive function. Fatigue is a very, very important one as well. We've already spoken about that today. Um, this is just from some data that we collected on patients recently. Um, but the more fatigued that you are, the more cognitive impairment you will have. And again, that's for anybody, let alone if you've had something like a brain tumor or some kind of neurological event. So being aware that fatigue management serves a very, very important um, purpose in maintaining cognitive function. Depression and anxiety. So depression and anxiety can be caused by cognitive impairment, but it can cause cognitive impairment too. And one of the most robust findings we always find when we look at cognitive function is that depression and anxiety will reduce cognitive function. The good thing is that depression and anxiety can be treated. So it's an opportunity to address that. Seizures as well. So quite often we see patients in clinic who are having uh, seizures. Now, not always overt seizures that are very evident, but sometimes what are called subclinical seizures or seizures that might not be so obvious or that might be only happening at night. Seizures have long and prolonged effects on cognition. So somebody who's having one seizure perhaps every week at night, we would expect to still see some kind of cognitive dysfunction, perhaps not every day, but certainly in the day or days following the seizure. Again, that's something that can be readily treatable. And pain as well. I can't tell you the number of times we've seen a patient who's come in from neurology for something else, but also has migraines or headache of some kind. And alongside that, we'll have a cognitive impairment because when you're in pain, you will not have normal cognitive function. And in fact, that's probably the purpose of pain is to direct our attention away from other things and uh, onto the thing that might be causing the pain. Um, and quite often treatment of the headache or migraine or wherever the pain might be has a huge effect on cognitive function. It's always a bit of a balancing act though, because treatments for pain, including medical, medical treatments, it can also cause cognitive dysfunction. So it needs to be managed carefully, but uh, quite often um, that's an important thing to consider. And so what do we do about those uh, secondary or secondary cause of cognitive dysfunction? Uh, firstly, optimizing sleep. So in some patients, that would be referral to a sleep physician for investigation of what might be an unrecognized sleep disorder, something like obstructive sleep apnea, for example. But for many people that might involve going to perhaps a clinical psychologist or a sleep psychologist to work on some strategies to improve sleep, uh, what's often referred to as maintaining good sleep hygiene. The hygiene is a bad word. It doesn't mean what we normally think of it. It just means good sleep practices. Uh, things, for example, avoiding white light before bed, not going to bed with a device or a phone where you're you know, looking at you know, websites and social media and things like that until late into the evening, uh, things of that nature. Understanding and managing your fatigue, and, and that really means a personalised approach because people are fatigued by different things and in different ways. So people can get physical fatigue, or cognitive fatigue or other kinds of fatigue, understanding what triggers that 
and uh, working to manage that as much as possible. And I'll talk about some professionals that can help with this later on, but again, clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, um, rehab physicians that can assist in understanding and managing fatigue. One of the most easy things to do in this regard is to keep a diary or a log of when you are feeling fatigued and what might trigger that. And that can help identify strategies to reduce it. Uh, treating low mood and anxiety. This is one of the easiest things to actually start to do. Uh, that can begin with a discussion with your GP and uh, referral to a clinical psychologist via a mental health care plan means that you can get Medicare rebates for that. Uh, so it's relatively easy to do. It can be difficult to find a clinical psychologist at the moment, um, but it, getting that ball rolling is relatively straightforward. Uh, managing seizures, if they're relevant to you or identifying if they're happening. And of course, managing pain. So um, again, clinical psychologists can help with that, but uh, probably uh, pain specialists or GPs um, are a good place to go as well. Um, and some general strategies for cognition that apply to everybody, um, of course, exercise. So physical exercise is very important for cognition in the moment, but also for maintaining good cognitive health in the long term. And that applies to anybody. Maintaining a healthy weight as well. So um, unfortunately, you know, relevant to many of us during COVID, we tend to put on a bit of weight, but uh, long-term obesity in particular is very bad for cognition. Um, and so maintaining a healthy weight, diet and so on, very important. Don't smoke and try not to drink alcohol. So of course, cigarette smoking is a risk factor for many diseases, but it's an independent risk factor for cognitive impairment uh, for a number of reasons, but also because it reduces your ability to engage in physical activity. Drinking alcohol, unfortunately, is something that we should probably be avoiding as much as possible. But for anybody who's had some kind of neuro-oncological, neurosurgical, or neurological event, even more important, alcohol really is not good for cognition. Socialising, recently social neuroscience, the evidence is mounting that socialising, engaging with other people as much as possible is one of the most important things you can do for your brain. It reduces the risk of things such as dementia. So the more social you are, the more engaged you are as much as possible, the better you'll do cognitively. A big question that we often get is around brain training. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this is a bit of a difficult one because they are pushed very heavily um, by commercial companies. Brain training is, you know, things such as luminosity, those kinds of things that, that uh, promise to improve your cognitive function if you just go and play some games online every day. The evidence is relatively clear at this point. It's been investigated a lot. And the evidence is that it probably doesn't help. And I've just put up a quote here from a recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of that. You know, it, brain training programs are sometimes good for enjoyment or entertainment purposes, but there really isn't much evidence that they can help improve your memory or general cognitive functioning. In fact, in many patients, it can have the opposite effect. So if you're someone who's worried about your cognition and, and you think there might be something wrong, doing cognitive tests over and over again online or on a computer that keep telling you that your memory isn't as good as it could be doesn't help your memory get any better. And really the best way, if you want to get better at doing work or socialising or reading books or whatever it is you want to return to, the best thing to do is practise doing that thing. There aren't really any shortcuts from brain training, unfortunately. If you are going to do brain training, be aware of these things and try and choose one that's free so you don't have to provide your credit card and pay for something that might not be very good for you. Um, who are the professionals who can help with cognition? Well, of course, general practitioner, neurosurgeon, your neurologist are the first people to talk to. Um, neuropsychologists for diagnosis and, and management of cognitive impairment. Hard to find sometimes, um, but worth a try. Clinical psychologists for management of mood and sometimes sleep and fatigue. So always worth talking to your general practitioner about a referral to a clinical psychologist uh, on a mental health care plan so you don't have to pay the full fee. Occupational therapists, absolutely essential for returning to things in the community, including cognition. Speech therapists, of course, for speech and language impairment. There are a number of strategies that you can use to improve in that regard. And exercise physiologists, a relatively new profession that's become very relevant uh, in the post-COVID world. But in terms of improving your fatigue um, and, and physical function, exercise physiologists are very, very good at that and help people work towards those goals. 
Um, people often ask about clinical neuropsychology services, how to get them. This is unfortunately, it's a very Victorian specific slide. Um, however, um, the best place to go if you can't get access through your treating hospital is to a university clinic. So the University of Melbourne Clinic, for example, offers highly subsidized neuropsychological services in a private care model. Uh, it's a training clinic, so you'll be seen by a consultant, but also by trainees, but a very high quality standard of care and, and very heavily subsidized. If you're not in Victoria, it's quite possible that uh, universities in your state who offer neuropsychology training programs would run similar clinics. So worth a try and don't be concerned about getting some, you know, because it's trainees in the clinic, you won't get the best treatment. We have trainees in the hospital as well. You'll be getting very, very good treatment and diagnosis from those services. Um, that's all I really wanted to say, but I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions, um, especially if I've sort of misjudged what I needed to talk about and if you've got anything specifically that I can help with. Thanks very much, Charles. That was great. I really appreciate that. Just on that note, I, I do think that you kind of answered that, but how do patients or who do patients talk to about getting a referral to neuropsychology for an assessment if that's something that they wanted to do or that we encourage them to do? Good, yeah, good question. The, the best place is probably through the, the main treating hospital um, or through your, whoever your main treating clinician is um, because they'll know people who are generally good and they'll have an idea of how to get access to those services. And, of course, public health services um, usually won't, it won't be a fee for that. Um, otherwise, um, it's, it, it can be quite difficult um, to to get through to somebody. So through private neurologists, private neurosurgeons, it's usually a bit better, but it's often very hard for GPs, for example, to know who to send somebody to. Um, there is a, um, uh, there are a few websites out there that can help, um, but sometimes again, they can be a little bit difficult to navigate. So I think probably through the, your main treating hospital is, is the best place. To okay, start. great, thank you. How, how roughly, how long would an assessment take? So how long, would a patient expect to be in like an initial consultation? Mm. You, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, so in our clinic, um, it would be a maximum of two hours. And that would be, so what you normally do with a neuropsychologist is first is, is talk about what you've noticed um, or uh, what other people have noticed about your cognition. And then there will usually be an examination of cognition. So that might involve tests of memory, language, and so on. So in our clinic, that would be maximum of two hours. Uh, in, that can vary. And there are some neuropsychologists who will, could do up to eight hours of testing spread over multiple days. Um, in my view, that's not necessary. And that's why we um, have a much uh, quicker and focused process. But it can vary. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to just thank you all for spending your Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, probably early Monday morning um, with us, you know, to spend your time when you're all in, you know, heavy professional jobs to do this on a Sunday afternoon. Big appreciation for that. So thanks very much for that. We'll just have a look at some of the um, questions. I... There were a few questions that initially came in uh, as emails. We did get to some of them this morning, but there were a few questions that we didn't get to are really around the meningioma area. We spoke a lot around high-grade gliomas this morning and GBMs, a little bit around oligodendrogliomas. Um, Kate, you did mention in your um, presentation around um, cognition with meningiomas. Can you speak a little bit more around that? Because I think that, you know, with meningiomas, it's surgical watch, maybe radiation, but there's not as much input as we would see for glioma patients. And maybe this is a little bit where they're then missing out on the supportive care stuff and, you know, services like Charles has. So just with your uh, online support thing, I think this is going to be a, a really good thing for meningioma patients as well. Yeah, look, I think, um, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, there's a couple of things there. I think, you know, there's now an, inter an international collaboration on meningiomas and um, Michael Jenkinson, will be, who's a member of that, and Galeray Zade, you know, will both be talking on that uh, 
and and you know we're all in that together. So so this is now an area of of you know very significant research as previously been an understudied area or just seen as a surgical disease. Um, it, it is amazing to me that we've studied over long time the um, meningiomas and also acoustic neuromas, which uh, you, you know you wouldn't think they could affect cognition at all. Um, I mean they're hanging off the eighth cranial nerve, and yet and yet we find out that those patients have uh, a long, at least a perception that their cognition is decreased. And and I think Charles would agree that you've got this sort of idea of you've got a perception of poor cognition versus actual poor cognition. It's very important to realise that exactly the same as, as my cognition doesn't change from day one to day two, but if in between there's no sleep um, and an operation for seven hours in the middle of the night, my co feeling about my cognition on day one and day two is very different. And so sometimes it's around the anxiety of the tumour, the fatigue associated with the surgery or whatever. So, you know, I think there's a whole there's a whole nexus of important things that we need to look into there that's very relevant for the meningioma patients as well. Um, and I think, you know, providing online services for this very large group of patients and, and starting to understand that symptom burden affects cognition, that that, you know, there there are other ways of looking at this um, will be will be really important. Um, it's interesting, we, we, we're just about to publish a cross-cultural group of um, Indian patients who've had meningiomas removed, who've had their QLQC30s done with Australian patients and comparing them. Um, and that certainly there's a lot of cross-cultural differences in, uh, in the way that people view their cognition and their quality of life um, after these tumours. So, you know, I, I think expanding capacity by using, um, you know, a, a technology-enhanced solution will be really great for this. Okay, so there's just another question that's come in for you, Kate. Just um, how do you see the online supportive care being rolled out nationally? I, like you, something that, you know, I'm in New South Wales, you're in Victoria, absolutely something that would be really beneficial for patients. So, so I think, look, I think there's an easy way and a hard way. I mean, this is certainly what we would like to do. Um, you know, the easy way is just to sort of um, add in um, healthcare professionals from other institutions uh, and provide sort of uh, modules and, and, and uh, um, forums for those, uh, those, uh, those groups. Now, now, if we ever were going to actually integrate into, say, the medical record, so, I mean, how fantastic would it be if information put into our digital platform could um, pop up as um, being at the beginning of your neurosurgical consult so that you could sort of start, you know, remind and remember or whatever that these are the problems that you had, that um, you could log symptoms within your medical record, for instance, or whatever. Um, if we're going to get to that level of integration, then basically um, I will probably go to the grave with dead hair, with grey hair and, uh, and, and, and much stress on trying to Across uh, healthcare borders and the privacy concerns that are involved with that, we are, however, building it um, proofed to be able to do that. But that will be well beyond the scope of the first three years. But I, I, you know, I would love for it to be that eventually. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, I've been in my role for I don't know, about twelve years or something, and we are making groundwork with the supportive care stuff. It is changing. There's fantastic ideas. There's much more collaboration, you know, the multidisciplinary approach. It's it's really getting there. Um, Maureen, with your caregiver workshops over in Toronto, how are they uh, run? How Do you specifically just see caregivers without the patient? Yeah, so... Um, so we, uh, our in-person um, care support groups are on hold at the moment, of course, because of COVID, but our model of support groups is two independent groups, one for patients, one for caregivers. And um, I, I didn't talk about it in the talk, but we have done um, uh, um, survey to sort of understand people, the benefit people get from the support groups. And one of the questions we asked was about people's feelings about bringing the groups together as one group. And um, in, interestingly, our caregiver group was more uh, 
vociferous about keeping the groups quite separate. Um, the patients were happy to combine the groups, but the caregivers felt that that ability to have a support solely for themselves um, was, was very helpful and important. Um, we've also run a number of workshops uh, specifically for caregivers that had programs um, offering a variety of things um, and um, really had good attendance to those types of events as well. I will say um, it is a challenge to try and um, as everybody here will know, a challenge to get caregivers to focus on their own uh, needs in the face of um, caring for somebody who has a, has a brain tumor. Yeah. Kate, do you think that with the online, the one that you're working on, <laughs> will this um, include caregivers? Will there be any part of the online support thing part of, for caregivers as well? Oh, totally. I mean, we yeah. see them as one of the most under, under, underserved groups. Yes. Um, so, you know, absolutely. Um, so, so we have exactly the same number of carers um, in our um, co-design, uh, in our co-design workshops and in our co-design process um, as we do, uh, as we do patients. Uh, so, so, so we certainly see this as being um, as important for carers as for patients. Yeah, I have to say, you know, for for me as a care coordinator, heavily rely on the carer. If the patient doesn't have a carer, that's when the wheels start to fall off the car, off the cart, you know. Um, and that carer master is humongous in neuro oncology, really educating caregivers. Um, and giving them the ability to trust what they're doing um, and the decisions that they're making, um, you know, is really empowering. So there was another question around that we also touched on um, around sleep and uh, the fatigue and the impact that has on cognition. And around sleep hygiene, I've got to say, um, so Charles, I'll ask you about this, but also... In the, in the face of drugs like dexamethasone, you know, when you're loading patients up with steroid and then trying them to get them to have a normal sleep pattern, you know, what do you suggest for this around the sleep hygiene and how to manage medications? Mm, so this is a very good question. And, it, and as you point out, it can be very, very difficult to balance different treatments, different side effects altogether. I think the first thing to start is actually by having the conversation, realizing that it's an independent contributor to cognitive dysfunction, but also of course, to quality of life and everything else. So quite often you, you talk to a patient, they've noticed this problem, but they haven't really told anyone about it, or it's sort of gone into the background because it, it doesn't seem to be a huge priority compared to everything else that's going on. So bringing the sleep into the foreground, I think is, is the main thing with whoever your main treating clinicians are. Um, and then, again, it has to be an individualised approach, I think, and, and treating what you can treat. Of course, there are some things you just can't do anything about. But, you know, an improvement in sleep of 5% is still better than an improvement of no percent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think sleep hygiene is where you start with that, raising it with the clinicians who are treating you, um, seeing if there's anything else you can try, and excluding really obvious things like pre-existing sleep disorders or comorbid sleep disorders. Because, you know, especially if you've got risk factors for something like sleep apnea or, or some sort of REM or non-REM sleep disorder, it might have been there all along and it just never got to the point where it was impacting anything. But then the tumours come along and it's changed things. So uh, probably not a bit of a non-answer there, but uh, hopefully it made some sort of rambling sense. It's a hard one. Kate, yeah. what do you suggest to patients when we have to use steroids, you know, and, how, and then we try and get them to maintain a good you know, sleep hygiene? Uh, so, like, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm a big wiener of steroids. You know, yeah. I, I tend to get patients off them as, as, as quickly as I can. Um, and I'm also not adverse. I know many of my colleagues are very frightened of using sleep aids, um, you know, short-acting benzodiazepines or something like that to, to um, realign patients' sleep uh, habits. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's all about, um, you know, getting the motivation, which, of course, 
you've got a brain tumour. It's not so easy to do, but getting the motivation to do all the right things, you know, um, get out and do some exercise in the afternoon, get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, get some sunshine on your retinas to, to, to get you awake. If you have an afternoon nap, then limit it and have someone come and poke you with a stick to get you out of bed so that you then get up and go and have your walk or your run or whatever you're going to do and, you know, do the sleep hygiene stuff. And I think, um, you know, that's something that's going to be on our online platform of like, how can you absolutely um, change your sleep patterns? Um, and, you know, what can you do? But, you know, we're, we're all, you know, not fantastic at doing this stuff. But I think it's I think it's really important to, to at least at least have in your toolbox what might help rather than being, you know, completely flummoxed with the idea of, well, what can I do to, to make this a difference, make a difference? Okay. Um, I just want to mention at this point that uh, this these sessions, the morning session and the afternoon session um, has been recorded. Uh, we will go through it and take out any blurps that we've had and you'll be sent a link uh, if you registered. Uh, you'll be emailed a link uh, and it'll go on to the BTAA website if you want to watch it again or you want to send it to somebody else. Um, and I think link to the fatigue thing or your attention. Uh, if you can't sit and watch it for, you know, the hours that we've been doing it, you can then watch it in bits and pieces and go back and review things, I think is a good thing as well. Um, there's also a survey that's in the chat area, which will all also be sent um, to all participants or attendees. If you could just return that uh, survey to us, just makes it a little bit easier and you know for us when we do future virtual conferences I'd say okay so I just want to go on there's another question that's popped up and Kate again sorry <laughs> you are the neurosurgeon on this afternoon a little bit about extent of resection um, and obviously your brain is your epicenter of everything. So, you know, whether you get a very good, you know, surgical resection or whether that's going to more impact a person's cognition. Can you speak a little bit around um, surgical extent, uh, extent of, uh, uh, surgical extent of resection? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this question actually is a little more about truth telling, um, or or giving information in a way that that it appears to be truthful. Um, so, I mean, my approach with my patients is um, certainly to make sure that they understand what the aims of the surgery are in advance. Now, that might be complete resection; it may not be. And I do a lot of awake surgery for eloquent tumours so you know knowing what we hope to achieve is really important um, and then making sure that we go through the scans ourselves uh, afterwards looking at a before and after scan you know sitting there looking at it together saying well what have we achieved and why did we need to stop or why didn't we get that bit or isn't it great we've got all these bits um, but of course being very truthful to say well I can make your scan look clean but your tumour's not gone uh, so, you know, to be sort of super honest in the way um, you deal with these things. Now, estimating what the effect that will have on cognition is much more difficult. Um, so removal of a large mass um, may actually improve your cognition, even though you're removing a part of the brain that would traditionally be... Uh, important for cognition because we know that neuroplasticity moves things sometimes. So removing the mass could actually improve the cognition. Having said that, our work on, say, removing the prefrontal cortex, a part of the front of the brain, can give you some very specific deficits. For instance, the ability to recognise emotions in each other or, or understand what's going on in someone else's head. Um, you know, it's a, such a specific cognitive deficit that will really impact the way you function. Predicting that sort of stuff is, is actually quite difficult to do, uh, you know, at any time. So um, I think, I think um, talking about extent of resection, I, you know, real honesty so that people really understand where they are and what you've achieved 
I think talking about likely effects on, on cognition is a little bit more difficult in advance. And, and, you know, basically I send my patients to Charles afterwards and say, okay, well, where are we actually now? And, and you know, do we have a specific deficit or, you know, is this more likely attentional related to fatigue or, or sort of where are we? So, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. Um, Maureen, in regard to care coordination where you are, because obviously in, you know, Australia we're a big country and everything's around the edges and there's not a lot of support for people that are regional and rural. Even in our big uh, metropolitan areas or hospitals, not every centre has got a care coordinator or somebody that they can contact to give them over the phone support, um, which I think is really important in this patient group. How, how do you, what's the Canadian perspective on this? Is it similar to us or...? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it is. There are a lot of similarities between, uh, I think as Kate pointed out earlier, a lot of similarities, big country, few people. And, um, and you know, it's very true, even in our centre, that vast majority of our patients don't live around the block from the hospital. They, they come a distance for their treatment. And so um, I, I think that's one of the benefits of our multidisciplinary team is that everybody is available certainly um, by phone um, and, and um, the benefit of a, an extensive multidisciplinary team too is that it's interesting that you know every, every patient will um, connect with somebody different on the team and I think I think that's a little bit of the magic of the, the personalities of people. you know you, some people click better and more closely with with different people on team it's not always the doctor it's not always the nurse sometimes um you know it's uh again the radiation therapist or um but um that's uh really as i say a benefit of having a, a large multidisciplinary team but there's no doubt in in my mind that technology does have a, a big role to play in a very beneficial way in the future and and things like online support for people who are um uh at a distance you know will be change life-changing for those people without a doubt um, and it's great that we have the technology now to be able to make those things um come to fruition Mm. I have so to I, say one, I, one benefit of COVID is these sorts of meetings. You know, you would have flown out here or we would have flown over to you. I would. <laughs> well, let me just say I would have loved. Yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. I would have loved to have flown. Um, and um, I think, you know, there I, again, as I, I mentioned in my talk, there is a magic too that, that comes from just being able to have yes. in-person live interactions. And, and so hopefully going forward with COVID behind us, we find a balance that yes. incorporates all those things in the, in the best way possible. Mm. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this is another question um, probably to Charles initially around, um, I'd say, cognitive changes or co cognitive deficits, not just relating to temozolomide and you know, long-term effects of that, I think of any of the treatments that we're giving patients, you know, do you see anything give greater cognitive deficits than anything else? Look, very hard to say, I think. Um, and also because I don't see all patients, you know, as a neuropsychologist, we see patients who are worried about their cognition or, or have a cognitive impairment. So we don't see the people who might be on a particular treatment and never develop that. Um, and I'm not very familiar with the, the scientific evidence specifically around those questions. Kate might know more about that. I would say it's always very, very messy in terms of all of the different things that could be contributing to cognitive impairment. Um, and often picking out one thing in particular, it, it's very hard to say if it has a particularly worse effect than something else. Uh, that might be a bit of a cop-out, but, but I think that's sort of the best I can do. <laughs> I think it's a bit hard because you, you know, these patients that we're seeing have a brain lesion. Mm. Um, the lesion may be causing cognitive, you know, deficits. 
And but the treatments that we give to, you know, continue life potentially do that. So it's a bit of a balance, I think, mm. um, as well. And that's the hard bit about it. Um, so there's another question for you in the in the Q&A as well, Charles. And, you know, this is around the time to get an appointment. I know here in Sydney it's probably about a three-month wait list to get our patients seen by neuropsych here. Um, so it's really just, I think, about speaking to your treating team and getting a, a, if you know that there's a bit of a wait list, get on the wait list as soon as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, what's Certainly. your views on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and shopping around, um, if, of course, people who are in a position to afford private neuropsychology often have a shorter waiting list, um, but it, it, it can be quite expensive. I think the big problem we have is that there's no Medicare rebate for neuropsychology. And there are a number of reasons for that. But I think if we could, we have been pushing for that for a number of years, um, that would change everything because it would open up a lot more private clinics, I think, um, and also help the hospitals with funding. Um, but no, it, it is a long waiting list sometimes, and unfortunately. Um, in our clinic, it isn't at the moment, but um, uh, often people can be waiting a year or a year and a half in some public hospitals, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, just another question um, about Optune. We don't have Optune here in Australia. Um, I've got a little bit of experience from some years ago. We actually sent some patients over to Switzerland we didn't particularly find it effective. Do you have access to Optune in Canada? Uh, we don't at the moment. Um, I, 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 we have a, we, we're going to have a clinical trial opening um, sometime, I think, in the, in the coming uh, year or maybe even as soon as the next few months. But, but it, it's just available. It would just be available through clinical trial. It's not available um, even if you want to pay for it, um, uh, you can go to the U.S. and um, it, but it's a very expensive treatment if you uh, choose to pay for it. Yeah, I think it's cost intrusive. Kate, um, your views on Optune? Uh, so I hope Optune works, but the data on which the uh, the data on the clinical trials is deeply flawed. Yes. And the reason the data on the clinical trials is deeply flawed is because there was no sham group. So we know uh, from other devices that uh, the more, um, so devices like spinal fusion or, or knee arthroscopy, we know that um, if you randomise patients to a group that has, you know, a backpack and electrodes and all of these fancy things that look very, you know, invasive and important and everything else, and you you randomise the other group to sort of nothing, then you will always get effect, an effect of what looks to be the more, you know, important, invasive, everything else um, uh, uh, um, intervention. We know that's true. You'll get a 30% placebo effect from that. Now, the, the company that made it, the Israeli company, um, they knew this and they, uh, they, 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 did, they said, oh, we will not have a sham trial where you put on electrodes and the electrodes heat up the scalp like the Optune does um, because they said, oh, it's, it's immoral or no, uh, no, sorry, unethical to shave the patient's head and put the, the device on if they are not actually receiving the therapy. Mm-hmm. So, I, I hope Optune works and, you know, I, Rob, Roger Stuck did the trial and, you know, very well respected oncologist. But until there is a trial with a sham device, I think that we're spending a lot, a lot of money on something that is really not well proven. Yeah. And, and uh, we so I won't, be, I won't be advocating to get something that costs 16000 American dollars per application or whatever it is down here until someone proves to me that it works. I think we've got better options. Yeah. And I think that we know from other trials that patients just do better on a trial because they're yeah. getting a lot more support. So maybe yeah, well, the, the data out of Optune showed us that supportive care actually helps people immensely, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true for a drug. Can you imagine how much more it is if you're 
you've got electrodes on your head and you're carrying around a backpack and you know it's a because we we know it's true for surgery i mean you know if you look for look at spinal surgery for for back pain uh, you know and you do a big fancy fusion with a big cut and a lot of rehabilitation and everything else and you send someone else to physio they'll do better it just is what it is so until we do the proper trial which i hope we do i mean i hope it works um you know i i will be a little skeptical yeah yeah okay thanks very much um so i'll just have a look is everybody else reading the questions coming in as well if you've got anything that you would like to discuss go for it i um, could probably answer a little bit about the one about cognitive impairment due to long-term radiation damage right. and i think uh i think the one thing to remember with that is that quite often when we see the cognitive impairment which is really the worst it's very old-fashioned radiotherapy uh, you know, Maureen's at a, sort of a centre of, of radiotherapy excellence um, with, you know, uh, sparing the hippocampus and very focused and targeted and much better delivered radiotherapy. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, there, there certainly are um, effects on the brain of radiotherapy, um, but I, I do think that we've got much better methods to uh, to improve that, I don't know if you want to if you want to talk about that, Maureen, because I mean you're you, really your centre with with um, Norman Lapierre and uh, you know th those guys are really leaders in in avoiding the cognitive problem. Well, I, I think um, to your point, Kate, certainly um, the way radiation therapy is delivered now, it's it, it's a very precise Star Wars really. Um, uh, type of treatment and and now the techniques that they use are as um, uh, focused on um, providing uh, precise treatment to the area of concern and protecting all of the other important parts of the brain and um, so you know the advancement in radiation therapy has been quite amazing in the last 15 or 20 years, like I'm not a radiation therapist or oncologist, but um, I, I know that to be true. And um, uh, so I, I'm sure moving forward, the long-term side effects of radiation treatment will be lessened and lessened um, over time. And, um, you know, the, the, the reality is though too, is that radiation therapy is a very effective treatment, one, probably the most effective treatment in controlling brain tumors and um, um, foregoing radiation treatment and means allowing tumor to progress. And so like many things, it's cost benefit, right? And, uh, and for many patients, the, the benefit of radiation Therapy, uh, therapy, even in the face of potential long-term cognitive effects, um, when it can extend survival so much, is really um, not a hard decision to make. Yeah, there's a question that's just come in around um, the term "old-fashioned radiation." Uh, you know, you, you can all input, but you know, back years ago they had 3D conformal radiation, which was more in a box, and nowadays they've got well IMRT, which is more sort of painted around the tumor rather than hit good brain. Does anybody else want to just talk about? the old fashioned radiation in comparison to what we can offer patients today? I think you're on. Uh, I, I'm, not, yep. I'm not a radiation oncologist, but you know, I, I do know that really old fashioned radiation was like a beam from this direction and a beam from this direction and a beam from this direction. And somehow they overlapped sometime in a bit of a square around the tumor and uh, you know, damn what was in between um mm -hmm. as as you got it there um which was, was still was somewhat you know the concept was cognitive sparing that you could use a number of different beams to concentrate at a particular area and have lower dose on the way in um you know now with 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 complex um you know shielding and what they call collimation where where you know the, a number of different beams can be used to uh you know, to, to really um, target just the tumour and the two centimetre margin, sparing some very important areas like the optic nerves, like the hippocampi, which are very important, medial temporal lobe, very important for, for memory. Um, you know, in my simple understanding of modern um, radiotherapy, you know, really um, 
this can be, uh, you know, uh, 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 much more of the brain can be spared or be given a very low dose. And I mean, that, you know, sort of the ultimate of that, which is not necessarily for, for intrinsic brain tumours, but the ultimate of that is something like, you know, gamma knife or stereotactic radiosurgery where, where, you know, lots and lots of little beams are sort of concentrated to a small area, much like the sun's rays through a magnifying glass. Where, whereas the rest of the brain really has very little dose delivered, so that's that old-fashioned radiotherapy. I think is the, you know, just just the less adequate targeting. Mm. And you do see that when you see patients that have had radiation twenty years ago, they do literally have a square box of where the treatment <laughs> was done. So you know, but they're still, you know, they've they're still going 20 years down the track. So, yeah. Uh, Just we're coming up to the last few minutes of the webinar. So, again, thank you all very, very much. I wanted to thank um, Dennis uh, Trataris. Um, I only really know him as Dennis, uh, of Arama Communications, who's done a great job and he's helped us out in the past with um, this webinar. Thank you, Dennis. Keeps us all in line and sends me messages to tell me what to do, which is good. I like that. So thanks very much for that. As I said, he's helped us with a few other um, sessions in the past. Um, And it'll be Dennis who will help us to put the video together down the track um, so that it's available for people on the BTAA website, I'd say, on YouTube and will be sent to you as a link as well. Again, just a reminder about the survey because that will really help us um, just put together uh, sessions that will help. I think today's been a fantastic session um, with a really broad range of information for patients um, and and it's information or, or questions that people ask us day in day out so I think you know people must be thinking the same thing so to have this availability to have this in one one webinar is a really really good thing for patients um, so just before we wrap up I just got, had one uh, few questions from you that was sent in um, probably towards Kate again sorry it's around meningiomas um, and grading on meningiomas I think people are just trying to understand at what point you know you would have treatment with you know from a from a surgical point of view at what point do you refer patients for further treatment uh oh well that's a shifting sand uh so so grade threes are easy you know the, the 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 treatment is 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 surgery and then followed by radiotherapy I think uh you know unless for instance, in a very elderly patient, which is often the case that you might think, well, recurrence is unlikely to, to, to be significant. Grade two, we don't know. We're becoming increasingly aggressive, but there is a uh, multinational, in, multi-centre international trial called the ROME trial, mm-hmm. um, which is randomising um, grade patients with grade two meningiomas to um, radiotherapy and not. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, hopefully that will give us um, some data on what's the right thing to do. Um, you know, grade one patients, uh, if at all possible, even at recurrence, I would support surgery over any other treatment. Um, but, uh, but you know, uh, sometimes with small tumours, of course, we treat them only with radiotherapy. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's quite a complex area. I think if you have a meningioma, the, the most important thing um, is to make sure, even even though it, you know it's primarily a surgical disease, again to be treated in a multidisciplinary clinic, you know that uh, that you want to work with a surgeon who you know is sitting next to a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist and a psychiatrist, and uh, you know just down the str- just down the the, the the hall from a neuropsychologist and with a care coordinator, and you you want to work with a neurosurgeon who does that. Um, and so, you know, I think if you do that and if you, you, you know that these people are all talking to each other, um, you know, which is exactly what Maureen's built as well, you know, you, you've got to have these people all in the same room together. And that, that creates a kind of normalisation of practice that, uh, that has everyone on the same page and makes sure that really patients get the best of everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the um, collaborative, you know, again, is just, I think, one of the main things. You can't look after the, 
patients with brain tumours in silos, you know. Is really I think, Maureen, she talked about it in a meeting where you're all bouncing things off each other and learning That's from right. each other. You know, ab- absolutely, absolutely critical that that, that that can happen. Yeah. Okay. So that's, um, we've reached the end of our session. It's three o'clock and uh, we'll end today. So thank you again all for coming, attending, taking part, giving your time. Um, Maureen, thank you very much for staying up so late. Um, Much appreciated. I just also wanted to really appreciate uh, Brain Tumor Alliance Australia and what they do for patients. Um, They're a great group, great support. They also collaborate very, very well. So thank you to them. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye.